the Saundarananda of Ashvagosha. Canto 1. A portrait of Kapilavastu. Om. Homage to the Buddha. A sage named Kapila Gautama, an outstanding upholder of Dharma, became as consumed in ascetic practice as was Kakshivat Gautama. Ceaselessly he shone his light like Kashapa the sun on blazing asceticism. And in promoting that asceticism, he pushed himself, like Kashapa the sage, to extreme achievement. For the offerings he served himself, he milked a cow, like Vasishta. In schooling his disciples in asceticism, he milked a cow, like Vasishta. In high-mindedness, he was like a second Dirga Tapas, and he was like a third in the mould of Kavya and Angiras in religious thought. On a bright slope of the Himalayas, this man, steeped in ascetic practice, had his ashram, the domain and the very seat of ascetic practices. Wooded with charming shrubs and trees and abounding in lush, soft grass, it was so thick with sacrificial smoke that it constantly resembled a rain cloud. With soft, sandy and smooth soil made yellowish-white by a covering of kesara blossoms and divided into areas with no commingling, it was like a body painted with cosmetic pigments. Pure, esteemed for their sacred presence, edifying and cultivating, like friends were the lakes it stood among, fluent and bearing lotuses. With abundant flowers and fruits beautifying the forests all around it, it shone and it flourished, like a man furnished with a means. Content to feed on wild rice and fruit, the ascetics were self-abiding, inhibited and retiring. Though the ashram was full of them, it seemed to be utterly empty. The sound of the fires receiving offerings, of the peacocks with their crested heads uttering their repetitive cry, and of the sacred bathing places during ablutions, was all that one heard there. The stags there, their manes beautifully braided, on undefiled elevations fit to be sacrificial altars, seemed as though, complete with puffy rice and mardavi flowers, they had been prepared as religious offerings. Even lesser creatures moved there in the same subdued manner as the stags, as if from their ascetic protectors they had learned the rules of discipline. Even in the face of a precarious immunity to rebirth, and notwithstanding inconsistencies in their time-honoured texts, there and then, as if seeing with their own eyes, the great ascetics practised asceticism. There some prayed to Brahma, none suffered the frustration of losing his way. The Soma, at the right moment, was measured out, and nobody, at a random moment, came to nothing. There, each disregarding his body, but having his own view with regard to Dharma, 
and almost bristling with zeal. The ascetics set about their ascetic practice of asceticism. There the toiling sages, hearts straining heavenward, seemed by their passion for asceticism almost to do Dharma a mischief. Now, to that ashram, that seat of intensity, that domain of austerity, there came certain sons of Ikshvaku, royal princes, wishing to stay. Tall they were, like golden columns, lion-chested, strong-armed, worthy of their great name and royal insignia and good upbringing. For deserving were they, where undeserving was he. Big-minded were they, where fickle-minded was he. And bright were they, where brainless was he, their younger half-brother. The royal authority that had come to him as his mother's bride price, they had not usurped. Rather, keeping their father's promise, they had retreated to the forest. The sage Kapila Gautama became their preceptor, and so, from the guru's surname, those Kautsas became Gautamas. Just as, though they were brothers born of one father, because they had different gurus, Rama became a Gargya and Vasubhadra a Gautama. And since they made a dwelling concealed among Shaka trees, therefore those descendants of Ikshvaku were known on earth as Shakyas. Gautama performed services for them as for his own sons. Like the Bhargava sage later did for the child prince Sagara. Like Kanva did for Shakuntala's son, the intrepid Bharata. And like the inspired Valmiki did for the inspired twin sons of Maitili. That forest, through the sage and through those warrior heroes, radiated tranquility and security, the majesty of the Brahmin and of the Kshatriya in one yoke. One day, while holding a jug of water, in his desire to nurture the prince's growth, the sage went up into the air. Then he said to them, There will fall to earth from this flowing jug, whose flowing is unbreakable, a line of drops. Do not overstep this mark, as in step you follow me. Yes, they said to this, and respectfully bowed, letting their heads fall forward. Then all went up onto chariots that were swiftly drawn and well prepared. So they followed him in the flow, while, walking on air, the ends of the earth of that ashram he sprinkled with water. He set out a plan like a chessboard, like an eightfold plan revealed by signs. Then the sage, standing still, spoke thus to those offspring of the guardians of the earth. Within this sprinkled line of drops, wherein your wheels have left a mark, you are to build a city when I am gone to heaven. Thereafter those lads when in time the sage passed away, roamed about in their unbridled youth, 
like elephants unchecked by a driver's hook. They roamed about with bows in hand and leather-clad fingers on arrows, shafts causing sizable quivers to swell, feathers preened and fastened on. Wishing to test their mettle among the elephants and big cats, they emulated the godlike deeds of the forest-dwelling son of Dushyanta. Seeing their natural character emerge as those lads grew, like tiger cubs, the ascetics abandoned that forest and retreated to the Himalayas. Then, seeing the ashram without ascetics, desolate, the princes were desolate in their hearts. In the red-hot anger of their indignation, they hissed like snakes. In time, through good conduct, they came to a maturity in which they could obtain the great treasures that are disclosed through acts of knowing them. Sufficient for full enjoyment of dharma, wealth and pleasure. Abundant and of many kinds. These were treasures beyond the reach of enemies. On the grounds of what they thus acquired and of the fading influence of their past karma, they who knew building at that site founded a splendid city. It had a moat as broad as a river a main street that straightened and curved, and great ramparts rising like mountains, as if it were another Girivraja. With its fine frontage of white watchtowers and a well-apportioned central market, overlooked by crescents of large houses, it was like a Himalayan valley, Brahmins versed in the Vedas and Vedangas and engaged in the six occupations. There they caused to pray for peace and for prosperity. The regular soldiers they employed there to repel assailants from their territory they caused with their sovereign power to be victorious in battle. Householders of character and means who were modest, far-sighted, worthy, stout and able, they caused to settle there. Individuals possessed of particular strong points, such as thinking, talking, and taking steps, they installed in corresponding offices as councillors and ministers. Thronged by men who were wealthy but not wanton, and cultured but not conceited, the city seemed like Mount Mandara thronged by Kimnaras. There, with glad hearts, Desiring to bring joy to the citizens, they commissioned those glorious abodes of beauty that we call gardens. And lovely lotus pools of finest quality water, not at anybody's behest, but because of being uplifted, they had dug in all directions. Rest houses of the first rank, welcoming and splendid, on the roads and in the woods, and complete even with wells, they caused to go up on all sides. Crowded with elephants, horses and chariots, the city was crammed with people who did not crowd each other. 
material wealth was available to the needy, not secreted. But learning and spirit ran secret and deep. Like a place where goals converge, where energies are focused, where learning activities are housed together, and where achievements come together. It was a homing tree for high flyers, a refuge for those seeking a place of rest, an arena for those skilled in scientific endeavour, and a tethering post for the mighty. By means of meetings, festivals and acts of giving, and by means of traditional observances, the heroes brought that city, the light of the world, to a glorious readiness. Since they never levied any tax that was not just, therefore in a short time they caused the city to be full. And since, on the site of the ashram of the Sia Capilla, they had built that city, therefore it was called Capilla Vastu. Just as cities sited on the ashrams of Kakanda, Makanda and Kushamba were called after them, so that city was called after Capilla. Those equals of Indra took charge of that city with noble ardour, but without arrogance. And they thus took on forever the fragrance of honour, like the celebrated sons of Yayati. But under the sons of kings, active though they were as protectors, that kingless kingdom lacked kingly lustre. Like the sky, though stars are shining in their thousands, before the moon has risen. So the senior among those brothers, in age and in merits, like the bull which is chief among bulls in bodily power, they anointed there, attaching to the important like the Adityas in heaven, anointing thousand-eyed Indra. Possessed of good conduct, discipline, prudence and industry, bearing the big umbrella for duty's sake, not to pander to the power of the senses. He guarded that realm, surrounded by his brothers, like roaring Indra guarding heaven with his retinue of storm gods. The first canto in the epic poem Handsome Nanda, titled A Portrait of Kapilavastu. Some time thereafter that realm passed through familial succession to a king named Shudor Danna, who, being pure in his actions, had conquered the power of the senses. Neither stuck in his desires nor conceited about gaining sovereignty, he did not, as he grew, look down on others, and nor did he shrink from others in fear. Strong and strong-minded, learned as well as intelligent, daring and yet prudent, determined and cheerful with it. He had a fine form without being stiff, was dexterous but not dishonest, was energetic but not impatient, and active but never flustered. Challenged by his enemies in battle and petitioned by friends, he was not backward in responding with an intense energy 
and with a willingness to give. Wishing to tread the dutiful path of Dharma trodden by previous kings, and bearing his kingship like a call to total dedication, he emulated the ancestors through his conduct. Due to his good governance and under his protection, his subjects rested at ease, free from anxiety, as if in a father's lap. Whether skilled in use of book or in use of sword, whether born into an eminent family or not, anybody who came into his presence was seen to be useful. When given good advice, however disagreeable, he listened and did not react. He let go of a wrong done to him, however great, and remembered a service rendered, however small. The meek and mild he befriended, tribal foes he apprehended, sufferers he comprehended, waverers he reprehended. As the general rule in his dominion, those influenced by his integrity seemed to take possession of virtues as if they were securing treasures. He minded the supreme sacred word. In fortitude he never failed. He gave fitting gifts to deserving recipients and no evil did he do at all. A promise undertaken he resolutely carried out, like a good horse carrying a load, for he did not desire, apart from truthfulness, even a moment of life. For the intellectually bright he was there. With his own self-containment he shone, and on people in the directed state he positively beamed, like the moon in the last month of the rains. Through intelligence and learning he knew what was fitting both in here and out there. He guarded with constancy and energy both his senses and his subjects. He bore away the suffering of the oppressed and the boastful fame of the cruel, and covered the earth with guiding principles and a much greater glory. Seeing people suffering, he overflowed with his original emotion as a man of compassion. But he did not, through eager desire, undermine his honour by unprincipled acquisition of treasured objects. In his kind-hearted, iron devotion, even to imperfect friends, he had no will to take, but willingly gave, cheerful-faced, to each according to his need. Without offering the first portion to revered beings, and without bathing, he did not eat anything. Neither did he milk the earth unjustly, as a cow is milked by a man thirsting for milk. He never scattered the food offering except when due. He never developed lordly arrogance. Committing of the scriptures to his mind, he did for dharma, not for praise. A few doers of harsh deeds, though they deserved harsh treatment, he did not treat harshly. And due to his noble nature, he never cast a veil over the virtues of a true man, even one who defied him. With his fine form he ripped away, as does the moon, people's views. 
he never touched in an act of becoming what belonged to others, any more than he would touch a venomous snake slithering on the earth. Nowhere in his dominion did anyone hurt by anyone lament, for the bow in his hand bestowed peace upon the afflicted. Even those who transgressed, if they were submissive, and before them, of course, those who acted agreeably, he surveyed with an affectionate eye and steeped in loving speech. He studied many subjects without being interested in objects, abiding in Dharma as it was in the Golden Age. He did not drift even in a predicament from Dharma. Because of his virtues, he continually grew. In his joy at the success of friends, he kept growing. In the stream of forebears long since grown old, again he kept going. But go he did not on a blameworthy path. He quietened his enemies using arrows. He gladdened his friends using virtues. His servants, when there were faults, he did not goad. The offshoots who were his subjects, he did not, with doing hands, overtax. Under his protection and because of his heroism, Seeds were planted over the whole earth, and by the transparent working of his judicial system, sessions were sat into the dark stillness of night. By the conduct of a royal seer, he propagated through his house the fragrance of honour. Like the sun of Aditi, shining light into darkness, he, with the intensity of his energy, caused the enemies to scatter. Using virtues that befitted a good son, he caused the ancestors, again, to disseminate their light. And like a rain cloud using rain, he enlivened his offshoots, his subjects, using conduct. With inexhaustible and great acts of giving, he caused the Brahmins to press out their Soma, and by dutifully adhering to his kingly Dharma, he caused corn at the right moment to ripen. He talked no talk that went against Dharma, being free in himself of doubts and questions. And, like a wheel-rolling king, he caused others to be courageous in service of Dharma. No special tribute did he cause the kingdom to pay him. But with sustained endeavour, and using only regulars, he caused enemy pride to be cut down. Again and again, he caused his own house to be pure, using just his own virtues. At the same time, he did not let his offshoots decay, for all were established in all dharmas. A man of tireless sacrifice, when the time was right, he caused sacrificial ground to be measured out, and he enabled twice-born men, who under his protection were unburdened by anxiety, to know the weight of the sacred word. In the presence of gurus and obeying the rule, he caused the soma to be measured out on time, as a cool, mild man of soma, and yet with intense ardour, with fiery energy, 
he saw the enemy army cut down to size. As Noah of the Dharma that is paramount, he caused his offshoots to abide in Dharma in a small way, and yet caused them, because of experiencing Dharma, to let heaven wait. Even the obvious candidate in a crisis he did not appoint if it went against Dharma. Nor, out of nothing more than fondness, did he dotingly promote incompetence. With intense energy and with light, he exposed to view his enemies, the conceited. And with a blazing lantern of brightness, he caused the world to shine. He gave out of kindness, not for his glorification, and always to meet a need. Giving up even a thing of great substance, he mentioned nothing of it. He did not shun one afflicted by suffering, even an enemy who had taken refuge. And having conquered his enemies, the conceited, he did not become proud on that account. No rule did he break, out of love, hate or fear. Even while abiding in pleasurable circumstances, he did not remain in thrall to the power of the senses. He was never seen to do shoddily anything anywhere that needed to be done. When required by friend and non-friend to act, he did not fall into inaction. He drank and guarded, as prescribed, the soma and his honour. And he was constantly mindful of the Vedas, as well as the Dharma proclaimed in the Vedas. Not eschewed by such uncommon virtues as these, was he who on no side could be vanquished, the unshakable Shakya king, like Chakra. Now at that time, Dharma-loving denizens of the heavens moved into the orbit of the human world, wishing to investigate Dharma movements. Those essences of Dharma moving with the desire to know Dharma over the earth saw that leader of men whose essence was particularly given over to Dharma. Then the Bodhisattva came down to earth and rather than among Tushita gods, he put down birth roots in the family of that earth lord. That man god at that time had a goddess, a queen whose name was Maya. She was as devoid of anger, darkness and the Maya which is deceit, as was the goddess Maya in heaven. In a dream during that period, she saw entering her womb a white six-tusked elephant, mighty as Airavata. When they heard this dream, Brahmins who knew dreams predicted the birth of a prince who would bring honour through wealth or through Dharma. At the birth of this exceptional being, whose mission was the end of rebirth, the earth, with its immovable mountains, moved, like a boat being battered by waves. A rain of flowers, unwilted by the sun's rays, fell from the sky as if shaken from the trees of Chitrarata's forest by the trunks of the elephants of the four quarters. Drums sounded in heaven, 
as though the storm gods were rolling dice. The sun blazed inestimably, and the wind blew benignly. Gods in Tushita heaven became calm and content, as did gods of the clear blue Shudavasa yonder, through thinking highly of true Dharma and through fellow feeling among sentient beings. To one who was a lamp of honour came a supreme bringer of the brightness of betterment. He shone with tranquil splendour, like Dharma in a separate bodily form. To the king's younger queen also, like fire in the notch of a fireboard, a son was born named Nanda, Joy, a bringer of constant joy to his family. Long in the arm, broad in the chest, with shoulders of a lion, and eyes of a bull. He, because of his superlative looks, bore the epithet handsome. Like a first month in spring having arrived, like a new moon having risen, again, like the non-physical having taken a physical form, he radiated sheer loveliness. The king, with exceeding gladness, brought up the two of them, as great wealth in the hands of a good man promotes dharma and pleasure. Those two good sons in time grew up to do the king proud, just as, when his investment is great, dharma and wealth pay a noble person well. Being in the middle with regard to those two good sons, the Shakya king reigned resplendent, like the Madhya Desha, the middle region, adorned by the Himalaya and Pariyatra mountains. Then, gradually, those two sons of the king became educated in practical arts and in learning. Nanda frittered all his time on idle pleasures. But Sarvarta Siddha, accomplisher of every aim, was not mottled by the redness of passions. For he had seen for himself an old man, a sick man and a corpse, after which as with a wounded mind he witnessed the unwitting world. He was disgusted to the core and found no pleasure in objects, but wished totally to terminate the terror of being born and dying. Having focused his agitated mind on the end of becoming, he fled the king's palace, indifferent to the most beautiful of women sleeping there. Determined to go to the forest, he fled in the night, like a goose from a lake of ruined lotuses. The second canto in the epic poem Handsome Nanda, titled A Portrait of the King, For ascetic practice, then, he left Kapilavastu, a teeming mass of horses, elephants and chariots, majestic, safe and loved by its citizens. Leaving the city, he started resolutely for the forest. In the approach to ascetic practice of the various traditions, and in the attachment of sages to various restraints, he observed the miseries of thirsting after an object. Seeing asceticism to be unreliable, he turned away from it. Then Arada, who spoke of freedom, 
and likewise Udraka, who inclined towards quietness, he served, his heart set on truth, and he left. He who intuited the path intuited, this also is not it. Of the different traditions in the world, he asked himself, which one was the best? Not obtaining certainty elsewhere, he entered, after all, into ascetic practice that was most severe. Then, having seen that it was not the path, he also abandoned that extreme asceticism. Understanding the realm of meditation to be supreme, he ate good food in readiness to realize the deathless. With golden arms fully expanded and as if in a yoke, with lengthened eyes and bull-like gait, he came to a fig tree growing up from the earth with the will to awakening that belongs to the supreme method of investigation. Sitting there, mind made up, as unmovingly stable as the king of mountains, he overcame the grim army of Mara and awoke to the step which is happy, irremovable and irreducible. Sensing the completion of his task, the denizens of heaven whose heart's desire is the deathless nectar, buzzed with unbridled joy. But Mara's crew was downcast and trembled. The earth with its mountains shook. That which feeds the fire blew benignly. The drums of the gods resounded, and from the cloudless sky rain fell. Awake to the one great ageless purpose, and universal in his compassion, he proceeded in order to display the eternal deathless nectar to the city sustained by the waters of the Varana and the Asi, to Varanasi. And so the wheel of Dharma, whose hub is uprightness, whose rim is constancy, determination and balanced stillness, and whose spokes are the rules of discipline. There the seer turned in that assembly for the welfare of the world. This is suffering. This is the tangled mass of causes producing it. This is cessation, and here is a means. Thus, one by one, this supreme set of four, the seer set out, with its three divisions of the unequalled, the incontrovertible, the ultimate, and with its statement of twelvefold determination, after which he instructed as the first follower him of the Kaundinya clan. For the fathomless sea of faults, whose water is falsity, where fish are cares, and which is disturbed by waves of anger, lust and fear, he had crossed, and he took the world across too. Having instructed many people at Kashi and at Gaya, as also at Girivraja, he made his way then to the city of his fathers, in his deeply compassionate desire to include it. To people possessed by ends, serving many and various paths, splendour had arisen that seemed like the sun. Gautama was like the sun, 
dispelling darkness. Seeing then all sides of Kapila Vastu, which was famed for its most beautiful properties, and was pure and clean in substance and design, and pleasantly wooded, he looked without longing, as though at a forest. For he had become free of belonging. He was sure in his thinking, the master of himself. How much less did he belong to those causes of manifold worry? Family, countrymen, friends and property. Being revered gave him no thrill, and neither did disrespect cause him any grief. His direction was decided, come sword or sandalwood, and whether the going was tough or easy, he was not diminished. And so the king learned that his son had arrived, as the Tathagata, the one arrived thus. With but a few horses straggling behind him, out the king charged, in his eagerness to see his son. The Sugata, the one gone well, saw the king coming thus, composure lost in expectation, and saw the rest of the people too, with tearful faces. Wishing to direct them, up he took himself, into the sky. He strode over heaven as if over the earth, and sat again, in the stillness of having stopped. Without changing his direction he lay down. He showed many changing forms, while remaining in this manner all of one piece. He walked over water as if on dry land, immersed himself in the soil as though it were water, rained as a cloud in the sky, and shone like the newly risen sun. Simultaneously glowing like a fire and passing water like a cloud, he gave off a light resembling molten gold like a cloud set aglow by daybreak or by dusk. Looking up at him in the network of gold and pearls that seemed to wrap around him like an upraised flag, the king became joyful beyond measure, and the assembled people, bowing down, felt deep appreciation. And so... Seeing that he had made a vessel of the ruler of men through the wealth of his accomplishments, and that the townsfolk also were amenable, the guide gave voice to the Dharma and the discipline. Then the royal hero reaped the first fruit for the fulfilment of the deathless Dharma. Having obtained unthinkable Dharma from the sage, he bowed accordingly in the sage's direction, as to a guru. Many then who were clear in mind, alert to the agony of birth and death, among mighty Shakya-born men of action, went forth into the wandering life, like bulls that had been startled by fire. But even those who did not leave home, out of regard for children, or father, or mother, they also, until their death, embraced the preventive rule. And, with ready minds, they held to it. No living creature, no matter how small, was subjected to violence, even by a person who killed for a living still less by a man of great virtue, good family, and unfailing gentleness, and how much less by a servant of the sage. The man, not shy of hard work, and yet still short of money, though he could not bear the other's slights, 
did not even so carry off the other's goods. For he shrank from other's riches as from a snake. Even the man of money and youth, with senses excited by objects of his affection, even he never approached others' wives, for he deemed them to be more dangerous than a burning fire. Nobody told an untruth, nor made true but nasty gossip, nor crooned slick but malicious words, nor spoke kindly words that had a backbiting motive. No greedy-minded person in his heart had any designs on the treasures of others. Seeing sensual happiness to be no happiness, the wise went freely on their way as if satisfied in that area already. Nobody showed any hostility towards the other. Rather, they looked on others with positive warmth, as mother, father, child or friend. For each person there saw in the other himself. That the fruit of conduct inevitably will be realised in the future is being realised now, and has been realised in the past, and that thus is determined how one fares in the world. This is an insight that again each experienced unerringly. By this most skilful and powerful tenfold means, by the means of their conduct, Although virtue was lax in a declining age, the people there, with the sage's help, fared well. But nobody there, because of his virtues, expected happiness in a resulting birth. Having learned that all becoming is pernicious, people worked to eradicate becoming, not to become something. Even householders were free from endless doubting, their views washed spotlessly away. For many had entered the stream, and others had reduced the passions to a trickle. Even one there who had been given over to ends like wealth, was now content with free giving, discipline and restraint. He also fared well, not straying from the true path. Neither from within the self nor from without did any terror arise, nor from fate. By dint of their true happiness and material plenty and practical merits, the citizens there rejoiced as in the golden age of manu. Thus exulting in freedom from disease and calamity, that city was the equal of Kuru, Raghu and Puru, with the great dispassionate seer serving there for the good of all as a guide to peace. The third canto in the epic poem Handsome Nanda titled A Portrait of the Tathagata. But even when the sage was there speaking the Dharma, and even though other family members heeded the Dharma, Nanda passed the time in the company of his wife, staying in the palace penthouse, solely occupied with love. For joined with his wife, like a grey lag gander with a grey lag goose, and fitted for love, he turned his thoughts neither to Vaisravana nor to Chakra. How much less in that state did he think about Dharma? For her grace and beauty, she was called lovely Sundari. For her headstrong pride, sulky Manini and for her sparkle and spirit, beautiful Barmini, so that she was called by three names. 
She of smiles like the bars of a bar-headed goose, of eyes like black bees, and swelling breasts like the upward-jutting buds of a lotus. Shimmered all the more a lotus pool in female form, with the rising of a kindred luminary, the sun-like Nanda. For, with inordinately good looks, and moves to match those heart-stealing looks, there was in the human world at that time, among women only Sundari, and among men Nanda. She, like a goddess wandering in Indra's gardens of gladness, and Nanda, the bringer of joy to his kin, seemed, having gone beyond mortals and yet not become gods, to be a creator's creation in progress. If Nanda had not won Sundari, or if she of the arched eyebrows had not gone to him, then, deprived of each other, the two would surely have seemed impaired, like the night and the moon. As though a target of the god of love and his mistress pleasure, as though a nest of ecstasy and joy, as though a bowl of excitement and contentment, blindly the couple took their pleasure together having eyes only for each other's eyes, minds hanging on each other's words, mutual embraces rubbing away the pigments that scented their bodies. The couple carried each other away. Like a Kimnara meeting a Kimnari by a cascading mountain torrent, in love with love, the two of them flirted and shone, as if vying to outdo one another in alluring radiance. By building up each other's passion, the pair gave each other sexual satisfaction, and by playfully teasing each other during languid intervals, they gladdened each other again. Wishing to cherish his beloved, he bedecked her there in finery, but not with the aim of making her beautiful. For she was so graced already by her own loveliness that she was rather the adorner of her adornments. She put a mirror in his hand. Just hold this in front of me while I do my face, she said to her lover. And up he held it. Then... Beholding her husband's stubble, she began to paint her face just like it. But with a breath on the mirror, Nanda soon took care of that. At this wanton gesture of her husband, and at his wickedness, she inwardly laughed. But, pretending to be furious with him, she cocked her eyebrows and frowned. With a left hand made languid by love, she took a flower from behind her ear and threw it at his shoulder. Again, as he kept his eyes half shut, she sprinkled over his face the scented makeup she had been using to powder herself. Then, at his wife's lotus like feet, which were girt in trembling ankle bracelets, their toes sparkling with nail gloss, Nanda bowed his head in mock terror. As his head emerged from beneath the discarded flower, he made as if to regain his lover's affections. He looked like an ornamental naga tree overburdened with blossoms that had toppled in the wind onto its golden pedestal. Pressing him so close in her arms that her pearls lifted off from her swelling breasts, she raised him up. What are you doing? she cried laughingly, as her earrings dangled across her face. 
Then, looking repeatedly at the face of her husband, whose hand had clung to the mirror, she completed her face painting, so that the surface of her cheeks was wet with tamala juice. Framed by the tamala smudges, her face with its cherry red lips and wide eyes extending to her hair, seemed like a lotus framed by duckweed, with crimson tips and two big bees settled on it. Attentively now, Nanda held the mirror, which was bearing witness to a work of beauty. Squinting to see the flecks she had painted, he beheld the face of his impish lover. The makeup was nibbled away at its edges by her earrings, so that her face was like a lotus that had suffered the attentions of a Karandava duck. Nanda, by gazing upon that face, became all the more the cause of his wife's happiness. While Nanda, inside the palace, in what almost amounted to a dishonour, was thus enjoying himself, the Tathagata, the one thus come, come begging time, had entered the palace for the purpose of begging. With face turned down, he stood in his brother's house as in any other house, not expecting anything. And then, since due to the servant's oversight, he received no alms, he went again on his way. For one woman was grinding fragrant body oils, another was perfuming clothes, another likewise was preparing a bath, while other women strung together sweet-smelling garlands. The girls in that house were thus so busy doing work to promote their master's romantic play that none of them had seen the Buddha, or so the Buddha inevitably concluded. One woman there, however, on glancing through a round side window on the upper story of the palace, had seen the Sugata, the one gone well, going away, like the blazing sun emerging from a cloud. Thinking in that moment of the importance of the worthy one to the master of the house, and through her own devotion to the worthy one, she stood before Nanda intending to speak, and then, with his permission, up she spoke. To show favour to us, I suppose, the Glorious One, the Guru, came into our house. Having received neither arms, nor welcoming words, nor a place to sit, he is going away, as if from an empty forest. When he heard that the great seer had entered his house and departed again without receiving a welcome, Nanda, in his brightly coloured gems and garments and garlands, flinched like a tree in Indra's paradise, shaken by a gust of wind. He brought to his forehead hands joined in the shape of a lotus bud, and then he begged his beloved to be allowed to go. I would like to go and pay my respects to the Guru. Please permit me this once. Shivering, she twined herself around him like a wind-stirred creeper around a teak tree. She looked at him through unsteady, tear-filled eyes, took a deep breath and told him, Since you wish to go and see the Guru, I shall not stand in the way of your Dharma duty. Go, noble husband, but come quickly back. 
before this paint on my face is dry. If you dawdle, I will punish you severely. As you sleep, I shall, with my breasts, repeatedly wake you, and then not respond. But if you hurry back to me before my face paint is dry, then I will hold you close in my arms, with nothing on, except fragrant oils. Thus implored and squeezed by a dissonant-sounding Sundari, Nanda said, I will, my little vixen, now let me go, before the Guru has gone too far. And so, with arms made fragrant by her swollen, sandal-scented breasts, she let him go, but not with her heart. He took off clothes that were suited to love and took on a form that befitted his task. She contemplated her lover leaving with brooding, empty, unmoving eyes. Like a doe standing with ears pricked up as she lets grass drop down. And as, with a perplexed expression, she contemplates the stag wandering away. With his mind gripped by desire to set eyes upon the sage, Nanda hurried his exit. But then he went ponderously and with backward glances, like an elephant looking back at a playful she-elephant. Between her swelling, cloud-like breasts, and the buttresses of her full thighs. Sundari's lean abdomen was like a golden fissure in a rock formation. Looking at her could satisfy Nanda no better than drinking water out of one hand. Reverence for the Buddha drew him on. Love for his wife drew him back. Irresolute, he neither stayed nor went, like a king goose pushing forwards against the waves. Once she was out of sight, he descended from the palace quickly. Then he heard the sound of ankle bracelets, and back he hung, gripped in his heart again. Held back by his love of love, and drawn forward by his love for Dharma, he struggled on, being turned about like a boat on a river, going against the stream. Then his strides became longer as he thought to himself, maybe the Guru is no longer there. Might I after all embrace my love, who is so especially lovable? while her face paint is still wet. And so, on the road, Nanda saw the one in whom absence was thus, the Tathagata, devoid of pride, and, even in his father's city, haughtiness thus absent. Seeing the possessor of ten powers stopping and being honoured on all sides, Nanda felt as if he were following Indra's flag. The fourth canto in the epic poem Handsome Nanda, titled What He Begged His Wife For. Then the Shakyas, each clothed in accordance with his wealth and accomplishments, got down from their horses chariots and elephants, and the traders came out of their big shops. By dint of their devotion they bowed down before the great sage. Some bowed and then followed for a while. Some bowed and went, being compelled to work. Some stood still at their own dwelling places. 
their hands joined and eyes observing him in the distance. The Buddha, then and there, on the royal road, struggled on into the gushing throng of the greatly devoted, as if entering the torrent of a river in the rains. And so, with the great and the good rapidly converging on the road to honour the Tathagata, Nanda was unable to make a bow, but still he could delight in the Guru's greatness. Wishing to shake off adherence to him on the road, while tending the devotion of people who were differently minded, and wishing to take Nanda in hand who was turning for home, the one gone well therefore took a different path. He of the solitary and separate mind, a knower of the true path, took a solitary and separate path. And Nanda, whose name was Joy, going out in front, could bow to him, the one gone beyond Joy, who was furthest out in front. Walking forward meekly, with respectful seriousness, with cloak over one shoulder, body half stooped, hands held down, and eyes raised up, Nanda stuttered these words. While I was in the palace penthouse, glorious one, I learned that you came in for our benefit, and so I have come in a hurry, indignant with the many members of the palace household. Therefore, rightly, O favourer of the righteous, and as a favour to me, be there at the palace, O supreme seeker of alms, at the time for eating alms. For the sun is about to reach the middle of the sky, as if to remind us of the time. Thus addressed by the bowing Nanda, whose expectant eyes looked up with tender affection, the one gone well made a sign such that Nanda knew he would not be taking a meal. Then, having made his bow to the sage, he made up his mind to head home. But, as a favour, the one gone well, with lotus petal eyes, handed him his bowl. The incomparable vessel was offering his own vessel, to reap a fruit in the human world. And so Nanda, outstretched, held the bowl with lotus-like hands, which were better suited to the holding of a bow. But as soon as he sensed that the mind of the one gone well had gone elsewhere and was not on him, Nanda backtracked. Wanting even with the bowl in his hands to go home, he sidled away from the path, while keeping his eye on the sage. Then, at the moment that he, in his yearning for his wife, despite holding the bowl, was about to head for home, just then the sage bamboozled him by blocking his entrance to the highway for he saw that in Nanda the seed of liberation, which is wisdom, was tenuous, while the fog of the afflictions was terribly thick. And since he was susceptible to the afflictions, and sensual by nature, therefore the sage reined him in. There are understood to be two aspects to defilement, Correspondingly, there are two approaches to purification. In one with stronger motivation, there is self-centeredness. In one who assigns weight to conditions, there is outer dependence. 
The one who is more strongly self-motivated loosens ties without even trying on receipt of the slightest stimulus. Whereas the one whose mind is led by circumstances struggles to find freedom because of his dependence on others. And Nanda, whose mind was led by circumstances, became absorbed into whomever he depended on. The sage, therefore, made this effort in his case, wishing to lift him out of the mire of love. But Nanda followed the guru meekly and helplessly, squirming with discomfort as he thought of his wife's face, her eyes looking out restlessly and the painted marks still moist. And so the sage led him, lover of garlands of pearls and flowers, whom the month of spring, love's friend, had appropriated, to a playground where women were a broken amusement, to the Vihara, beloved as a pleasure ground of learning. Then the greatly compassionate one, watching him in his moment of misery and pitying him, put a hand with wheel-marked palm on his head and spoke to him thus. While murderous time has yet to come calling, set your mind, my friend, in the direction of peace. For operating in all situations, using all manner of attacks, death kills. Restrain the restless mind from sensual pleasures, which are common, dreamlike and insubstantial. For no more than a wind-fanned fire is sated by offerings are men satisfied by pleasures. Most excellent among gifts is the gift of confidence. Most satisfying of tastes is the taste of real wisdom. Foremost among comforts is being comfortable in oneself. The bliss of ignorance is the sorriest bliss. The kindest hearted friend is he who tells one what is truly salutary. The most meritorious effort is to exhaust oneself in pursuit of the truth. Supreme among labours is to work towards true understanding. Why would one enter into service of the senses? Select then that which is conclusive, which is beyond fear, fatigue and sorrow, and which is neither dependent on others nor removable by others. Select the lasting and benign happiness of extinction. What is the point of enduring disappointment by making an object of sense objects. Nothing takes away people's beauty like ageing. There is no misfortune in the world like sickness and no terror on earth like death. Yet these three inevitably shall be obeyed. There is no fetter like love, no torrent that carries one away like thirst, and likewise no fire like the fire of passion. If not for these three, happiness would be yours. Separation from loved ones is inevitable, on which account grief is bound to be experienced. And it is through grief that other seers who were princes have gone mad and fallen helplessly apart. So bind on the armour whose fabric is wisdom, for the arrows of grief 
are as naught to one steeped in patience. And kindle the fire of your own energy to burn up the great tangled web of becoming, just as you would kindle a small fire to burn up undergrowth collected into a great heap. Just as a man concerned with science, herbs in hand, is not bitten by any snake, so a man without concern, having overcome the folly of the world, is not bitten by the snake of grief. Staying with practice and fully committed to what is, at the hour of death he is not afraid. Like a warrior hero standing in battle, clad in armour and equipped with a good bow, with skill in archery and with the will to win. Addressed thus by the one thus come, the Tathagata, in his compassion for all living beings, Nanda, while sinking inside, said boldly to the Sugata, the one well gone, So be it. And so, wishing to lift him up out of heedlessness, and deeming him to be a vessel worthy of the living tradition, the great seer, with kindness in his heart, said, Ananda, let Nanda go forth towards tranquillity. Then the sage of Videha said to Nanda, who was weeping inside, Come. At this Nanda approached him meekly and said, I won't go forth. On hearing Nanda's idea, the Videha sage related it to the Buddha. And so, after hearing from him also as to Nanda's actual state, the great sage spoke to Nanda again. O oh, you who have yet to conquer yourself, given that I, your elder brother, have gone forth and your cousins have gone forth after me, and seeing that our relatives who remain at home are committed to practice, are you minded to be conscious of consciousness, or are you not? Evidently, the royal seers are unbeknown to you who retreated smiling into the forests. Having spat out desires, they were desirous of tranquillity and thus not stuck in lower order desires. Again, you have experienced the drawbacks of family life and you have observed the relief to be had from leaving it. And yet you, like a man in a disaster area who is resigned to his death, have no intention of giving up and leaving house and home. How can you be so devoted to the wasteland of samsara and so devoid of desire to take the auspicious path when, like a desert trader who drops out from a caravan, you have been set on that very path? One who, in a house burning on all sides, instead of getting out of there, would lie down in his folly to sleep. Only he might be heedless, in a world burning in the fire of time, with its flames of sickness and ageing. Again, like the condemned man being led, drunkenly laughing and babbling, to the stake, Equally to be lamented is one whose mind is upside down, cavorting while death stands by with noose in hand. When kings 
and humble householders, leaving relations and possessions behind, have gone forth, will go forth, and even now are going forth. What is the point of pandering to fleeting fondnesses? I do not see any pleasure which might not, by turning into something else, become pain. Therefore no attachment bears scrutiny, unless the grief is bearable that arises from the absence of its object. So, my friend, knowing the human world to be fickle, a net of Indra, a web of fictions, like a gaudy magic show, abandon the net of delusion you call my love, if you are minded to cut the net of suffering. Unfancied food that does one good is better than tasty food that may do harm. On that basis, I commend you to a course which, though unpalatable, is wholesome and honest. Just as a nurse keeps firm hold of an infant while taking out soil it has put in its mouth, so, wishing to draw out the dart of passion, have I spoken to you sharply for your own good. And just as a doctor restrains a patient and gives him bitter medicine, so have I given you, in order to help you, this disagreeable advice with beneficial effect. Therefore, while you are meeting the present moment, while death has yet to come, so long as you have the energy for practice, decide on better. Addressed thus by his benevolent and compassionate guide, Nanda said, I shall do, glorious one, all that you say, just as you teach it. At this, the sage of Videha reclaimed him and held him close as he led him off, writhing. And then, while Nanda's eyes welled with tears, he separated the crowning glory of his hair from the royal umbrella of his head. As his hair was thus being banished, his tearful, downcast face resembled a rain-sodden lotus in a pond, with the top of its stalk sagging down. Thence, in drab garb, with the dull yellow-red colour of tree bark, and despondent as a newly captured elephant, Nanda resembled a waning full moon at night's end, sprinkled by the powdery rays of the early morning sun. The fifth canto in the epic poem Handsome Nanda, titled Nanda is caused to go forth. And so, with her husband riven away through his respect for the guru, bereft of her happiness, left joyless. Though she remained at the same spot, high up in the palace, Sundari no longer seemed to be herself. Anticipating her husband's approach, she leant forward, her breasts invading the bull's-eye window. Expectantly, she looked out from the palace roof towards the gateway, her earrings dangling down across her face. With her pearl necklaces hanging down and straps dishevelled as she bent down from the palace, she looked like the most gorgeous of the heavenly nymphs 
the Apsarases, gazing from her celestial abode at her lover, as he falls down, having used up his ascetic credit. With a cold sweat on her beautiful brow, her face paint drying in her sighs, and her eyes restless with anxious thoughts, there she stood, suspecting her husband, somewhere else. Tired out by a long time standing in that state, she dropped just where she stood onto a couch, and lay across it with her necklaces scattered, and a slipper half hanging off her foot. One of her women, not wishing to see Sundari in such tearful distress, was making her way down from the palace penthouse, when she burst into tears, and made a commotion with her feet on the stairs. Hearing the sound on the stairs of that woman's feet, Sundari quickly jumped up again. Transfixed with joy, she bristled with excitement, believing it to be the approach of her beloved. Scaring the pigeons in their rooftop roosts with the jangling of her ankle bracelets, she dashed to the stairwell without worrying in her excitement about what extremity of her diaphanous raiments might be falling off. On seeing the woman, she was crestfallen. She sighed, threw herself again onto the couch, and no longer shone. With her face suddenly pallid, she was as grey as a pale moon sky in early winter. Distressed at not seeing her husband, burning with desire and fury, she sat down with face in hand and steeped herself in the river of worries whose water is sorrow. Her lotus rivaling face resting on the hennaed stem of her hand was like a lotus above the reflection in the water of its mud-borne self drooping down. She considered various possibilities in accordance with a woman's nature. Then, failing to see the truth that her husband had taken refuge in the Dharma, while obviously still impassioned and in love with her, she constructed various scenarios and uttered various laments. He promised me I'll be back before your makeup's dry. From what cause would such a cherisher of promises as my beloved is be now a breaker of promises? In him who was noble, good, compassionate, always in awe of me, and all too honest, how has such an unprecedented transformation come about? Through a loss of passion on his part? From a mistake of mine? The heart of my lover, lover of sexual pleasure and of me, has obviously waned in its passion. For if he did still love me, Having regard for my heart, he would not have failed to return. Another woman, then, in beauty and in nature, better than me, my beloved has surely beheld. For, having soothed me as he did, with empty words, the guy has gone and left me, attached to him as I am. As for that devotion to Buddha of which he spoke, it was just a line to me for leaving. For if he were clearly settled on the sage, he would fear untruth no less than a grisly death. 
While I put my makeup on, he held the mirror as a service to me and thought of another. If he holds it now for that other, so much for his fickle affection. Any woman who does not wish to suffer grief like this should never trust a man. How could he treat me before with such regard, and then, in a twinkling, leave me like this, like anybody? This she said and more, love lorn, and suspecting her love of loving another. Then the giddy weeping woman, having dizzily climbed the palace stairs, tearfully told her these words. Though he may be young, good-looking, full of noble ancestry, and filled with charm and fortune, never did your husband cheat on you. You are being silly and judging him amiss. Ma'am, do not accuse your loving husband, a doer of loving deeds who merits your love. He never even looks at any woman other than you, like Greylag Gander with kindred Greylag Goose. For you he wished to stay at home, for your delight he wished to live. But his noble brother, the Tathagata, so they say, has banished him, his face made wet by tears, into the wandering life. Then, on hearing what had happened to her husband, all of a sudden up she leapt, shaking. She clasped her arms and screamed out loud, like a she-elephant shot in the heart by a poisoned arrow. Her eyes, puffed up and reddened by tears, the slender trunk of her body trembling with anguish, she broke and scattered strings of pearls as down she fell, like a mango branch weighed down by too much fruit. Wearing clothes suffused with lotus colours, with lotus face and eyes as long as lotus petals, she was like a lotus-hued Lakshmi who had fallen from her lotus pedestal, and she withered like a lotus garland left in the sun. She thought and thought about her husband's good points, sighing long and hard, and gasping as she flung out the arms that bore her gleaming jewels and hennaed hands with reddened fingertips. Now I don't have any need for ornaments, she cried, as she hurled her jewels in all directions. Unadorned and drooping, she resembled a creeper shorn of blossoms. She clasped the golden-handled mirror and reflected. My husband held this up for me. And the tamala paint she had applied so carefully, she rubbed aggressively off her cheeks as if the paint had angered her. Like a grey lag goose, when a hawk has wounding talons on the gander's wing, she hooted mightily, as if in competition with the cooing pigeons on the palace roof, whose throats were all a-tremble. She lay down to sleep in soft and gorgeous bedclothes, on a bed bedecked with cat's eye gems and diamonds. But in her costly crib with golden legs she tossed and turned, and no respite did she obtain. She eyed her husband's ornaments, his clothes, guitar, and other items of amusement. Thus she entered deeply into darkness, she raised a shriek and then, as if descending into a mire, sank down. Her belly trembled out of breathlessness 
like a cave being rent inside by fiery thunderbolts. As in her innermost heart she burned with the fire of grief, Sundari seemed at that moment to be going out of her mind. She howled, then wilted, screamed, then swooned. She reeled, stood rooted, wailed, then brooded. She vented anger and rended garlands. She scratched her face and slashed her clothes. Hearing the howling of the lovely toothed one, for oh how lovely were her teeth, the ladies in waiting suffered utmost torment. They climbed from inside the palace up to the roof, like nervous kimnaris ascending a mountain peak. Their despondent faces wet with tears, like lotus ponds with rain-soaked lotus buds. They settled down along with her, according to rank and as they wished, and along with her they burned in grief. On the palace roof, enfolded by her women, the slender Sundari, gaunt with worry, seemed like a streak of crescent moon enshrouded among the autumn clouds, by a hundred rays of lightning. There was one among them there, however, who was senior in years and good with words, a well-respected woman. Holding Sundari from behind in a firm embrace and wiping tears away, she spoke as follows. Grief does ill become you, the wife of a royal seer, when your husband has taken refuge in Dharma. For in the lineage of Ikshvaku, an ascetic forest is a desired inheritance. Well you know of wives of Shakya bulls gone forth in search of freedom. As a rule, they turn their houses almost into ascetic groves and they observe the vow of chastity, as if it were a pleasure. If your husband had been stolen by another, due to her superior looks and qualities, then tears you should let flow. For how could any beautiful and virtuous wife, who abounds in excellence, refrain from shedding teardrops, when her heart was broken. Or had he met with some disaster, and may no such thing ever be, then yes, tears, because there is no greater sorrow for a woman of noble birth who dignifies her husband as if he were a god. But on the contrary, he now is roving happily meeting no disasters, but enjoying a healthy and fruitful life. Free from eager longing, he is following Dharma. At a time for celebration, why are you in such a state of weeping consternation? Though this woman, with her unctuous kindness, thus put forward many sorts of argument, Sundari could not be satisfied at all. Then another woman, with a sense of intimacy, said what helped her mind and fit the occasion. Truly and categorically, I am telling you that soon enough you'll see your husband back again. Dispossessed of you, the fellow will survive out there no longer than living things survive when dispossessed of consciousness. Even in the lap of luxury, he could not be happy, lacking you there by his side. 
and even in the direst pickle. Not a thing could trouble him as long as you were in his sight. Be happy. Don't keep crying. Spare your eyes from shedding molten tears. The way he feels for you and his passion are such that he, bereft of you, will find no pleasure in the Dharma. Some might say that having worn the ochre robe, he won't relinquish it by dint of noble birth combined with strength of character. But he put it on unwillingly while looking forward to going home. What fault is there in taking it back off? Thus consoled by her little women, when her husband had purloined her heart, Sundari came to earth, just as Ramba, with her heart turned towards Dramida, came once upon a time, enfolded in the midst of Sister Apsarases. The sixth canto in the epic poem Handsome Nanda, titled A Wife's Lament. Bearing the insignia, then, whose form was fixed by his teacher, bearing it with his body, but not with his mind, and being constantly carried off by thoughts of his wife, he whose name was Joy was not joyful. Amid the wealth of flowers of the month of flowers, assailed on every side by the flower-bannered god of love, and with feelings that are familiar to the young. He stayed in a vihara, but found no peace. Standing distraught by a row of mango trees, amid the numbing hum of hovering insects, he with his lengthy arms and yoke-like shoulders, thought of his beloved and forcibly stretched himself open, as if drawing a bow. Receiving from the mango trees a rain of tiny flowers, like saffron powder, he thought of his wife and heaved long sighs, like a newly captured elephant in a cage. He had been, for those who came to him seeking refuge, an abater of sorrow, and for the conceited a creator of sorrow. Now he leant against the tree of freedom from sorrow, the Ashoka tree, and he became a sorrower. He sorrowed for a lover of Ashoka groves, his beloved wife. A slender Priangu creeper, beloved of his beloved, he noticed shying away as if afraid and tearfully he remembered her, his lover with her tearful face, as pale as a Priangu flower. Seeing a cuckoo resting on the flower-covered crest of a tilaka tree, he imagined his lover leaning against the watchtower, her curls and tresses resting on her white upper garment. A vine with flowers whiter than pearls, the Atimuktaka, having attached itself to the side of a mango tree, was thriving. Nanda eyed the blossoming creeper and fretted. When will Sundari cling to me like that? The budding teeth of yawning Naga trees erupted there like ivory caskets filled with gold. 
but they drew his anguished eye no better than desert scrub. The Ganda Parna trees emitted their fragrance like a Gandava's girlfriend, brimming with perfume. But for him whose mind was elsewhere, and who was sorrowful to the core, they did not win the nose, they pained the heart. Resounding with the throaty cries of impassioned peacocks, with the satisfied celebrating of cuckoos, and with the relentless supping of nectar by bees, the forest encroached upon his mind. As there he burned with a fire arisen from the fireboard of his wife, a fire with fancies for smoke and darkest hell for flames. As he burned in his innermost heart with a fire of desire, fortitude failed him, and he uttered various laments. Now I understand what a very difficult thing those men have done, will do, and are doing, who have walked, will walk, and are walking, the way of painful asceticism leaving behind their tearful-faced lovers. There is no bond in the world, whether of wood or rope or iron, as strong as this bond, an amorous voice and a face with darting eyes. For having been cut or broken by one's own initiative or by the strength of friends, those bonds cease to exist, whereas the fetter made of love, except through wisdom and toughness, cannot be undone. That wisdom is not in me which might make for peace, and since I am of a kindly nature, toughness also is lacking. I am sensual by nature, and yet the Buddha is my guru. I am stuck as if inside a moving wheel. For though I have adopted the beggar's insignia, and am taught by one who is twice my guru, as elder brother and enlightened sage, in every circumstance I find no peace, like a grey lag gander separated from its mate. Even now, it continues to run through my mind how after I clouded the mirror she pretended to be angry and said to me as she wickedly laughed, What are you doing? Again, the words she spoke to me while her girlish eyes were swimming with tears. Before this paint on my face is dry, come back. Those words even now block my mind. This beggar, meditating at ease, who has crossed his legs in the traditional manner and is of the waterfall, arising out of the foot of the hill. Surely he is not as attached as I am to anybody, since he sits so calmly with an aura of contentment. Deaf to the cuckoo's chorus, his eyeballs never grazing upon the riches of spring. This fellow concentrates so intently upon the teaching that I suspect no lover is tugging at his heart. Credit to him who is firm in his resolve, who has retreated from curiosity and pride, who is at peace in himself, whose mind is turned inward, who does not strive for anything as he walks up and down and beholds the lotus-covered water and the flowering forest where cuckoos come calling. What man in the prime of youth could keep such constancy in those months of spring which are, as it were, the rival of Dharma? with their way of being, their pride, their way of moving, 
their grace, with a smile or a show of indignation, with their exuberance, with their voices, women have captivated hosts of gods and kings and seers. How then could they fail to bewilder a bloke like me? Overcome by desire, the fire god Hiranyaretas, golden sperm, succumbed to sex with his wife, oblation, Svaha, as did the bountiful Indra with nymph Ahalya. How much easier to be overwhelmed by a woman am I, a man who lacks the strength and resolve of the gods? Our tradition has it that the sun god Surya, roused to passion for the dawn goddess Saranyu, let himself be diminished for the sake of pleasure with her. He became a stallion so as to cover her as a mare, whereby she conceived the two charioteers. When the mind of Vaivasvata, son of the sun, and the mind of the fire god Agni turned to enmity when their grip on themselves was shaken. There was war between them for many years because of a woman. What lesser being here on earth would not be caused to stray by a woman? And through desire, the sage Vasishta, who even among the upstanding was eminent, had his way with an outcast, Akshamala, string of beads, to whom was born his son, Kapinjalada, an eater of earth and water to rival the sun. So too did the seer Parashara, user of curses as arrows, have intercourse with Kali, who was born from the womb of a fish. The son he conceived in her was the illustrious Dvaipayana, classifier of the Vedas. Dvaipayana, equally, while having Dharma as his primary object, enjoyed a woman at a brothel in Kashi. Struck by her foot with its trembling ankle bracelet, he was like a cloud being struck by a twist of lightning. So too did Brahma begotten Angiras, when his mind was seized by passion, have sex with Sarasvati. To her was born his son, Sarasvata, who gave voice again to missing Vedas. Likewise, Kashyapa, at a sacrifice under the aegis of the royal seer Dilipa, while fixated on a celestial nymph, took the ceremonial ladle and cast into the fire his own streaming semen, whence was conceived Asita. Angada, equally, though he had gone to the ends of ascetic practice, went overwhelmed by desire to Yamuna, and in her he begat the super-bright Ratitara, the super-charioteer and friend of the spotted deer. Again, on catching sight of the princess Shanta, tranquillity, though he had been living in tranquillity in the forest, the sage Rushya Shunga, antelope horn, was moved from steadfastness, like a high-horned mountain in an earthquake. And the son of Gardhin, who, in order to become the Brahman seer, renounced his kingdom and retired to the forest, having become indifferent to sensual objects. He was captivated by the nymph Gurtachi, reckoning a decade with her as a single day. So too, 
when heat by an arrow fired by love, did Stula Shiras, thick head, lose his senses over Ramba. He, with his libidinous and wrathful nature, was reckless. When she refused him, he cursed her. And Ruru, after his beloved Pramadvara had been robbed of her senses by a snake, exterminated snakes wherever he saw them. He failed in his fury to maintain his reserve or his ascetic practice. As grandson of the hair-marked moon, as son of the learned Buddha and the goddess Ida, and as one marked by personal honour and virtue, Pururavas had the special powers of the lunar and the very learned. But thinking of the Apsaras Urvashi, this royal seer also went mad. And when Long Shanks Tala Janga, on top of a mountain, was reddened in his libidinous state with passion for the Apsaras Menaka, from the foot of all beneficent Vishvavasu, he got an angry kick, like a thunderbolt striking a hintala palm. When his favourite female drowned in the waters of the Ganges, King Janu, his mind possessed by disembodied love, blocked the flow of the Ganges with his arms, as if he were Mount Mainaka, the paragon of non-movement. And King Goodbody, Shantanu, when separated from Goddess Ganga, shook like a shala tree whose roots the Ganges was washing away. The son of Pratipa and light of his family, he of the body beautiful, became uncontrollable. Again, when the avatar Saunandakin took away his Urvashi, she of the wide expanse, the wife whom, like the wide earth, Somavarman had made his own, moon-armoured Somavarman, whose armour, so they say, had been virtuous conduct, roamed about grieving, his armour pierced by mind-existent love. A king who followed his departed wife in death was the dreaded Bhimika, he who was dread power on earth, he who was famed because of his military might as Senaka, the missile of war. He who was, with his war machine, like a god of war. Again, when Kali's husband Shantanu had gone to heaven, Jana Mejaya, causer of trembling among men, in his desire to marry Kali, came up against Bhishma, the terrible, and accepted death from him, rather than relinquish his love for her. And Pandu, the pale one, having been cursed by passion to die on coupling with a woman, went nonetheless with Madhuri. He heeded not the death that would result from the great seer's curse, when he tasted what he was forbidden to taste. Hordes of gods and kings and seers such as these have fallen by dint of desire, into the thrall of women. Being weak in understanding and inner strength, all the more discouraged when I cannot see my beloved am I. Therefore I shall go back home again and properly make love as I please. For the insignia do not sit well upon a backslider from the path of Dharma, whose senses are restless and whose mind is elsewhere. 
When a man has taken the bowl in his hand, has shaved his head, and, putting pride aside, has donned the patched-together robe, and yet he is given to pleasure and lacking in firmness and tranquillity, then like a lamp in a picture, he is there, and yet he is not. When a man has gone forth, but the red taint of desire has not gone forth from him, when he wears the earth-hued robe, but has not transcended dirt, when he carries the bowl, but is not a vessel for the virtues, though he bears the insignia, he is neither a householder nor a beggar. I had thought it improper for a man with noble connections, having adopted the insignia, to discard them again. But even such a scruple fades away when I think about those royal heroes who abandoned an ascetic grove and went home. For the Shalva king, along with his son, and likewise Ambarisha and Rama, and Anda, and Rantideva, son of Sankurti, cast off their rags and clothed themselves again in finest fabrics. They cut their twisted dreadlocks off and put their crowns back on. Therefore, as soon as my guru has gone from here to beg for alms, I will give up the ochre robe and go from here to my home. Because for a man who bears the honoured insignia, with unsound judgment, stammering mind, and weakened resolve, no ulterior purpose might exist, nor even the present world of living beings. The Seventh Canto in the epic poem Handsome Nanda titled Nanda's Lament. Then, while Nanda was looking forward with unsteady eyes and the eagerest of expectations to going home, a certain striver with a benevolent air approached him and said, in a friendly way, Why this face so clouded with tears that reveals a darkness in your heart? Come to constancy, restrain your emotion, for tears and tranquillity do not sit well together. Pain invariably arises in two ways, in the mind and in the body. And for those two kinds of pain, there are healers skilled in education and in medicine. So if this pain is physical, be quick to tell a doctor all about it. For when a sick man conceals his illness, it turns before long into something serious. But if this suffering is mental, tell me, and I will tell you the cure for it, because for a mind enshrouded in gloom and darkness, the healer is a seeker who knows himself. Tell the whole truth, my friend, if you think it fit to be told, to me. For minds have many ways of working and many secrets, wherein concealment is complicated by conceit. Pressed in this way by the striver, while wanting to explain his own decision, Nanda clung to him with hand in his hand and went into another corner of the forest. And so there the two of them sat, 
in a vibrant bower of flower-spewing creepers, whose soft young shoots, stirring in a soft breeze, seem to be hiding them away. Then, in between the heavy sighs that intermittently gripped him, he expressed his intention, which was a hard one for a man who was knowingly gone forth to express. He told it to the beggar, who was so adept at hearing and talking. Evidently, it befits a devotee of Dharma, who is always friendly towards any living being, that the benevolence inherent in your compassionate nature might be shown to me in my inconstancy. And that is why I would like especially to speak to you who preach propriety. For what I am feeling now, I would not tell to a man who was out of balance in himself, and who, though a good talker, was not a true person. Hear me then when I say, in short, that without my beloved I do not enjoy the practice of Dharma. I am like a Kimnara without his lover, roaming about, his seaman ready, over mountain peaks. I am averse to the happiness of the forest life, and simply want to go home. For without her I obtain no comfort, like a king without his sovereignty. When he heard those words of Nanda, who, with his mind on his beloved wife, was burning with pain, the striver, softly, while allowing his head to shake, said to himself, hmm, What a pity! In its longing for the herd, a rushing stag that has escaped the mortal danger of the hunter's arrow, is about to enter the hunter's trap, deceived by a call that the hunter sang. Truly, a bird that was caught in a net and set free by a benevolent person, desires, as it flits about the fruiting and blossoming forest, to fly of its own volition into a cage. A baby elephant, truly, after an adult elephant has pulled it up out of the deep mud of a dangerous riverbed, is wishing in its thirst for water to enter again that crocodile-infested creek. In a shelter where slithers a snake, a sleeping boy, awoken by an elder who is already awake, has become agitated, and truly he is about to grab the horrible reptile himself. Truly, having flown up and away from a tree that is blazing in a great forest fire, a chick in its longing for the nest is wishing to fly there again, its former alarm forgotten. Truly, a pheasant separated from its mate through fear of a hawk, and so stupefied by desire as to be helpless, is lacking in resolve and lacking in reserve. The pathetic little beggar is living a pitiful life. Greedy and untrained, devoid of decency and intelligence, truly a wretched dog is wishing to eat again some food that he himself has vomited. So saying, the striver contemplated Nanda for a while, beholding him tormented by the sorrows of love. Then, in his eagerness to be of benefit, the striver spoke fine words, which were unpleasant to hear. For you who draws no distinction between good and bad, whose mind is settled on objects of the senses, and who is without the eye of attainment, 
naturally, no delight could there be in being better. Again, to him whose thinking is not firmly fixed in the matters of hearing, grasping, retaining, and understanding the supreme truth, and in the matter of mental peace, to him who easily changes his mind, joy in Dharma is not apportioned. But that joy is certainly known to one who sees the faults in objects of the senses, who is contented, pure and unassuming, whose mind is versed in the religious acts that generate peace, and whose understanding therein is formed. A covetous man delights in opulence, a fool delights in sensual pleasure, a true person delights in tranquillity, having transcended sensual enjoyments by virtue of his knowledge. What is more, when a man of good repute, a man of intelligence and breeding, bears the honoured insignia, his consciousness inclines towards home no more than a mountain bends in the wind. Only a man who aspires to dependence on another, spurning autonomy and self-reliance, would yearn, while he was on the auspicious path to peace, for life at home with all its faults. Just as a man released from prison might, when stricken by some calamity, betake himself back to prison, so might one who has retired to the forest, seek out again that bondage called home. The man who has left his strife behind, and yet would like nothing better than to go back again to his strife, he is the fool who would leave behind and then return, with his senses still unconquered, to the strife that is a wife. Like poisonous, clinging creepers, like swept-out caves still harbouring snakes, like uncovered blades being held in the hand, women are calamitous in the end. Sexy members of the female gender engender sexual desire, whereas unsexy ones are fearsome since they bring with them either a fault or fear, in what way do they merit attention? So that kinsman breaks with kinsman, and friend with friend. Women, who are good at seeing faults in others, behave deceitfully and ignobly. When men of good families fall on hard times, when they rashly do unfitting deeds, when they recklessly enter the vanguard of an army, women in those instances are the cause. They beguile with lovely voices and attack with sharpened minds. There is honey in women's speech and lethal venom in their hearts. A burning fire can be held, the bodiless wind can be caught, an angry snake can be captured, but the mind of women cannot be grasped. Without pausing to consider looks or wealth or intelligence or breeding or valour, women attack no matter what like a ragged assortment of crocodiles in a river. No charming speech, nor soothing caresses, nor any affection do women ever remember. The female, even when cajoled, is flighty. So rely on one no more than you would your enemies in this world. Women flirt with men who give them nothing, 
with generous men, they get restless. They look down with disdain on the humble, but towards the arrogant show simpering contentment. They lord it over men of merit, and submit like children to men who are devoid of merit. When men with money are around, they act rapaciously. Men who are short of money, they treat with contempt. Just as a cow, having gone from one pasture to another pasture, keeps right on grazing, however she's restrained, so a woman, without regard for any affection she felt before, moves on and takes her pleasure elsewhere. For though women ascend their husband's funeral pyre, though they follow at the cost of their own life, though the restraints placed upon them they can indeed bear, they are not truly capable of genuine friendship. Women who sometimes, in some small way, please their husband by treating him like a god, a thousand times more in their fickle-mindedness, please their own heart. The daughter of Senajit the conqueror, so they say, coupled with a cooker of dogs. Kumudvati, the lilipu, paired up with Minaripu, the foe of fishes, and Burhadarata, the burly heroine, loved a lion. There is nothing women will not do. Scions of the Kurus, Haihayas and Varshnis, along with Shambara, whose armour was mighty magic, and the sage Ugra Tapas Gautama, the Gautama of grim austerities, all incurred the dust of passion which a woman raises. Ungrateful, ignoble, unsteady, such is the mind of women. What man of wisdom could allow his heart to be fastened onto such fickle creatures? So, you fail to see how pernicious, in their intense duplicity, are their little lightweight hearts. Do you not see at least that the bodies of women are impure, oozing houses of foulness? Day after day, by means of ablutions, garments and jewels, they prettify an ugliness which you, with eyes veiled by ignorance, do not see as ugliness. You see it as beauty. Or else you do see that their bodies are foul, but intelligence is lacking in you. For the fragrant task in which you are engaged is extinction of the impurity that originates in them. Cosmetic paste and powder, garlands, gems and pearls, gold and fine fabric. What have these fine things, if fine they are, got to do with women? Let us examine what inherently in women is so immaculate. Dirty and unclothed, with her nails and teeth and body hair in their natural state. If she were like that, your Sundari, whose name means beautiful woman, surely wouldn't be such a beautiful woman to you now. What man who was capable of disgust would touch a woman, leaking and unclean like an old bucket, if she were not scantily clad, in skin as thin as a flying insect's wing? If you see that women's bodies are bony skeletons wrapped around with skin, and yet you are forcibly drawn by passion, 
Truly, then, love is immune to disgust and lacking in all restraint. In nails and in teeth, in skin and in hair, both long and short, which are not beautiful, you are inventing beauty. Dullard, don't you see what women originally are made of and what they originally are? So then, reckon women, in mind and in body, to be singularly implicated with faults, and hold back, by the power of this reckoning, the mind which strains so impulsively for home. You are educated, intelligent and well-bred, a fitting vessel for supreme tranquillity. As such, you ought not in any way to break the contract into which you have entered. For the man of spirit and noble birth, for the man who cherishes honour and strives to earn respect, for the man of grit, better death for him than life as a backslider. For just as he is blameworthy who, having girded his armour on and taken up a bow, then flees in his warrior's chariot away from the battle, so he too is blameworthy who, having accepted the insignia and taken to begging, then allows the stallion of his senses to be carted away by desire. And just as it would be ridiculous to go begging while bedecked in the finest ornaments, clothes and garlands, while holding an archer's bow and with a head full of passing fancies, so too is it ridiculous to subsist on offerings having consented to shapelessness, while longing thirstily for the comforts of home. Just as a hog, though fed on the best of food and lain on the finest bedding, would, when set free, run back to his familiar filth, so, having tasted the excellent pleasure of cessation while learning the better way, would a man of thirsting libido abandon the tranquil forest and yearn for home. Just as a flaming torch, when fanned by the wind, burns the hand that holds it. Just as a snake, being swift to anger, bites the foot that steps on it. Just as a tiger, though caught as a cub, mauls the one who took it in. So too, does association with women, in many ways, make for disaster. Therefore, know these faults to be mentally and physically bound up with women. Understand how sensual pleasure, as it flows away like river water, makes for affliction and for sorrow. See the world in the shadow of death to be fragile as an unbaked pot and make the peerless decision that leads to release instead of causing the neck to stiffen up through sorrowful yearning. The eighth canto in the epic poem Handsome Nanda titled A Tirade Against Women. Though the beggar reproached him in such a manner, Nanda did not arrive at any kind of tranquillity with regard to his beloved. So much did he think about her that he failed, as if he were unconscious, to hear a word the other said. For 
just as an invalid who wants to die does not accept the kind advice of a doctor who intends to do him good, so Nanda, bubbling with strength and looks and youth, did not accept that salutary advice of the striver. It is not surprising in such a case that one whose mind is shrouded in darkness should be overpowered by the wrongness that arises out of a tainted desire. For a person's wrongness ceases only when the darkness of ignorance, having reached its limit, begins to diminish. And so, observing Nanda to be caught up as he was in his own strength and looks and youth, seeing him all set to go home, the striver chastised Nanda in the name of tranquillity. Your strength and looks and youthfulness I recognise as you do, but that these three are impermanent you do not realise as I do. For this body is a domicile for disease, and in the face of senility it teeters helplessly, like a tree with its roots on a river bank. Because you do not know it to be as fragile as froth on water, therefore you feel there to be abiding strength in you. When, through failure to eat and drink or sit down or move about, and also through overindulgence in those acts, the body manifestly goes to ruin, what reason is there for you to have the conceit of physical strength? By cold and heat, by sickness and ageing, and by hunger and other such adversities, the living are being reduced like water in the hot season by the sun's rays. In these circumstances, what are you thinking O taker of pride in strength, as you wander towards your end. When a body made of skin and bone and flesh and blood owes its very existence to the taking of food, when it is always ailing, needing continuous intervention, how can you labour under an illusion like I am inherently strong. Like a man who aspires to cross the stormy ocean in an unbaked earthen pot, is he who would assume the sapless accretion of his body to be strong as he carries it around, striving after an object. But even more fragile than an unbaked earthen pot, in my opinion, is this body. For a pot that is properly kept might survive for many ages, whereas this accretion crumbles even if well maintained. When the elements of water, earth, wind and fire are in constant opposition, like antagonistic snakes, when they meet in a body only to make for calamity, how can you, in your propensity to sickness, be convinced of your strength? Snakes are lulled by charms, but the elements are not apt to be charmed. Snakes bite some people some of the time, the elements strike all people all of the time. For this body, though long tended with good habits of sleeping and sitting and of eating and drinking, does not forgive a single step too far, at which it rears up in anger like a great venomous snake. 
Pained by cold, one turns to fire. Oppressed by heat, one longs for cold. When hungry, one longs for food. When thirsty, for water. Where then is strength? What is it? How is it? Whose is it? So see a body as ailing, and do not think, I am possessed of strength. The world is insubstantial, inauspicious, and uncertain, and in an impermanent world, power is undependable. Where is the power of Kurtavirya's son? the thousand-armed Arjuna, who fancied himself to be so strong. In battle, Bhargava, the scion of the Burgus, severed his arms like a thunderbolt, lopping off the lofty horns of a mountain. Where is the strength of Hari Krishna, the Kamsa tormentor, who broke the horse king's jaw? With one arrow from Jaras, he was brought down, like utmost beauty brought down in due order by old age. Where is the strength of Namuchi, son of Diti, light of an army and provoker of the gods? He stood his ground in battle, furious as death, but Indra slew him, with a spattering of foam. And where is the power once possessed by the Kurus, who blazed in combat with speed and stamina, and then lay in ashes, like sacrificial fires whose firewood has burned, their life breath snuffed out? Know, therefore, that the strength of powerful men who fancy themselves imbued with strength and drive, is ground down. And do not, as you survey a world in the sway of ageing and death, take pride in strength. Whether or not you think your strength is great, just do battle against the senses. If you are victorious in this, your strength is great. If you are defeated, your strength is nothing. Less heroic are those men thought who conquer enemies armed with horses, chariots and elephants than those heroic thinkers are thought who conquer the restless six senses. Again, that you think I am good-looking is not astute. Let this be grasped. Where are the good looks? Where the beautiful bodies of Gada, Shamba and Sharana? Just as a peacock, flashing the eye in its tail, naturally carries its excellent looks. That is how Without any distinction got from grooming the body, you must carry your looks, if, after all, you are good-looking. If its unpleasantness were not covered with clothes, if it never touched water after excretion, or if it never received a good washing, tell me, O oh handsome one, what might a body be like? Again, perceiving the prime of life to be a personal belonging, your mind looks forward to going home and gaining its sensual end. Curb that mind. For like a river coursing down a rocky mountain, youth passes swiftly and does not return. A season that has passed comes around again. The moon wanes and waxes again, but gone, gone, never to return.
is the water of rivers and the youth of men. When you were white-whiskered and wrinkled, with broken teeth and sagging brows, when you were lacking in lustre, when, humbled by age, you see your face grown old, then you will sober up. Having wasted nights and greeted dawns, drinking the most intoxicating liquor, one finally comes around. But drunk on strength and looks and youth, no man ever comes round until he reaches old age. Just as sugar cane, when all its juice has been squeezed out, is thrown on the ground to dry, ready for burning, so, pressed in the vice of ageing and drained of energy, does the body wait to die. Just as a saw worked by two men cuts a tall tree into many pieces, so old age, pushed and pulled by day and night, topples people here and now who are high and mighty. Robber of memory, destroyer of looks, ender of pleasure, Caesar of speech, hearing and sight, birthplace of fatigue, slayer of strength and manly vigour. For those with a body, there is no enemy to rival ageing. Knowing this great terror of the world named ageing, to be a pointer on the way to death, do not rise to the ignoble conceit of an eye that is beautiful or young or strong. With your mind tainted by I and mine, you are latching on to the strife called a body. Let go of that if peace is to come about, for I and mine usher in danger. When no one has dominion over a body that is ravaged by manifold misfortunes, how can it be right to recognise as I or as mine this house of calamities called a body? One who would delight in a flimsy, snake-infested hovel that was always unclean and constantly needing repair. He is the man of perverted view who would delight in a body with its corrupted elements and unclean, unstable state. Just as a bad king takes forcibly from his subjects his full toll of taxes and yet does not protect, so the body takes its full toll of provisions such as clothes and the like and yet does not obey. Just as in soil, grass sprouts readily, but rice is grown through sustained effort, so too does sorrow arise readily, whereas happiness is produced with effort, if at all. For him who drags around a hurting, perishable body, there is no such thing in the supreme sense, as happiness. For what he determines to be happiness, by taking countermeasures against suffering, is only a condition wherein suffering remains minimal. Just as the intrusion of even a slight discomfort spoils enjoyment of the greatest longed-for pleasure, in a similar way, Nobody ever enjoys any happiness by disregarding suffering that is upon him. You fail to see the body as it is, full of suffering and inconstant, because of fondness for its effects. Let the mind that chases after effects, like a cow after corn,
be restrained by the reins of steadfastness. For sensual enjoyments, like offerings fed into a blazing fire, do not make for satisfaction. The more one indulges in sensual pleasures, the more the desire for sensual objects grows. Again, just as a man suffering from the blight of leprosy does not obtain a cure by way of application of heat. Similarly, one who goes among sense objects with his senses unconquered does not tend towards peace by way of sensual enjoyments. For just as desire for pleasure from one's medicine might cause one to accept one's infirmity instead of taking proper measures against it, so, because of desire for one's object, might one ignorantly rejoice in that receptacle of much suffering which is a body. One who wishes adversity on a man is said, because of that action, to be his enemy. Should not sense objects, as the sole root of adversity, be shunned as dangerous enemies? Those who were his deadly enemies in this world can in time become a man's friend, but not benign for anybody in this or other worlds are the desires which are the causes of suffering. Just as eating a tasty, colourful and fragrant kimpaka fruit leads to death, not nourishment, so an imbalanced person's devotion to objects makes for misfortune and not for well-being. As an innocent, then, heed this good advice pertaining to liberation, dharma and so forth, Affirm my opinion, with which the righteous concur, or else speak up and state your agenda. Though reproached at length in this salutary fashion by a striver so great in hearing what is heard, Nanda neither found firmness nor took comfort. He was like a tusker in full rut, mind blinded by lust. Then, having assured himself that Nanda's being was not in the Dharma, but was turned unsteadily towards the comforts of home, that beggar reported back to the investigator of living creatures' dispositions, tendencies and ways of being, to the Buddha, knower of reality. The ninth canto in the epic poem Handsome Nanda, titled Negation of Vanity. Thus did he hear about Nanda's desire to abandon sincere practice, to see his wife and to go home. And so the sage summoned the joyless and weak-willed Nanda, wishing to take him up. When Nanda, having not yet arrived at liberation's path, arrived, he of the beautiful mind questioned him whose mind was faltering. Bowed down by humiliation, Nanda confessed to the one who was full of humility. He told his intention to a master intention knower. And so the Sugata, the one gone well, seeing Nanda wandering in the darkness called wife, took his hand and flew up into the sky, wishing to take him up, like an honest man in the water, bearing up a pearl. A shining gold they shone, with their ochre robes in the clear sky. Like a pair of grey lag geese 
rising up from a lake, embracing one another with outstretched wings. Filled with the heady fragrance of the divine Diodar, full of rivers and lakes and springs and gulches, and filled with golden ore, was the Himalayan mountain full of divine seers at which the two arrived immediately. On that auspicious mountain, which was frequented by celestial singers and saints, and blanketed in smoke from burnt offerings, as if on an island in an unsupported sky where no far shore is reached, the two stood. While the sage, his sense power stilled, remained there standing, Nanda looked all around in amazement at the caverns and bowers and forest dwellers that were the mountain's jewels and its guardians. For there, on a great long horn of white rock, lay a peacock with its tail feathers arrayed so as to resemble on the long and muscular arm of Bala, an armlet of cat's eye gems. A lion with shoulders made orange from contact with the orange-red ore of the mind rock, arsenic, looked like arm because crumpled armband of wrought silver streaked with refined gold. A tiger moved unhurriedly and expansively, its tail curling around its right shoulder as it went to drink at a mountain spring. It looked like an offering to the ancestors, being made by somebody who has arrived at water. A yak had got stuck in a dangling kadamba tree swaying on the Himalayan hillside. Unable to free its tangled tail, it was like a man of noble conduct who cannot break away from a kindness that has been shown in his house. Communities of golden mountain men, the Kiratas, their limbs streaked with shining peacock gall, rushed out from their caves like flying tigers, as if spewed out of the unmoving mountain. Hanging out in nooks and crannies, and going beyond beauty with their heart-stealing hips, breasts and bellies, were the bevies of Kimnaris, who appeared in every quarter, like creepers, with flowers in their upward winding curls. Pestering the godly deodars, monkeys roved from peak to peak, obtaining from those trees no fruit, they went away, as if from powerful masters whose favour is futile. But lagging behind that troop, was one whose face was red as pressed red resin, a female monkey with one eye missing. Seeing her, the sage spoke this to Nanda. Which Nanda, in beauty and in manner, is the lovelier in your eyes, this one-eyed monkey or the person who is the focus of your wishing? Addressed thus by the one gone well, Nanda said with a slight smirk, How can a gap be measured, glorious one, between that most excellent of women, your sister-in-law, and this tree-tormenting monkey? Then the sage, hearing his protestation, and having in mind a slightly unconventional means, took hold of Nanda as before, and proceeded to the pleasure grove of the royal bearer of the thunderbolt. 
There, one by one, season by season and moment by moment, trees convey their individual form. While some odd ones also bring out the combined manifold glory of all six seasons. Some produce garlands and wreaths which are fragrant and affecting with variously interwoven strands and small round creations suited to the ear which are akin to earrings opponents. Trees there that abound in red lotuses, look like trees ablaze. Different trees, growing full-blown blue lotuses, seem to have their eyes open. In various colourless hues, or else white, beautifully illuminated with golden dividing lines, beyond the weaving together of strands, being nothing but a unity are the exquisite robes that trees there bear as fruit. Pearl necklaces and gemstones, supreme earrings, choicest armlets and ankle bracelets are the kinds of ornament fit for heaven that trees there bear as fruit. There rise golden lotuses with beryl stems and diamond shoots and stamens. Receptive to touch, they have a scent of the ultimate. Still pools without ripples allow them to grow. All kinds of musical instrument, with lengthened sinews and widened skins, with open tubes and solid substance, are born there as fruit by the distinctively bejeweled and gilded trees which are the heaven dwellers playing companions. Over mandara coral trees and over trees weighed down with water lily and ruddy lotus blossoms, the full grown coral shining there with majestic qualities steps up and reigns supreme. Growing there on soil tilled in Indra's heaven by unwearying ploughs of austerity and discipline are such trees as these, which are always adapting to provide for sky dwellers' enjoyment. Birds there have bright red beaks the colour of red mind rock arsenic and crystalline eyes and wings a deathly shade of yellow with intensely red tips and claws as red as red dye but half white. Birds which are again different with distinctively golden wings and bright beryl blue eyes Birds called Shinjirikas fly to and fro, carrying away minds and ears with their songs. Adorned with curling feathers that are red at the tips, golden in the middle and the colour of beryl within borders, birds there move. Winged ones of a different ilk, named Rochishnus, who have the lustre of a blazing fire, their faces seeming to be aglow, roam around, shaking views with their wonderful appearance, and carrying Apsarases away with their splendid sound. Their merit-makers do whatever they like, constantly erect. They are free from pain, free from ageing and beyond sorrow, each by his actions inferior, superior or in the middle, each letting his own light shine, the merit-makers rejoice. 
seeing that world to be in a perpetually elevated state, free from tiredness, sleep, discontent, sorrow and disease, Nanda deemed the ever-afflicted world of men, under the sway of ageing and death, to be akin to a cremation ground. Nanda beheld Indra's forest all around him, his eyes wide open with amazement. And the Apsarases surrounded him, bristling with joyous excitement, while eyeing each other haughtily. Eternally youthful and devoted purely to love, the Apsarases are zones of recreation open to all who have made merit. They are the heavenly and innocent resort of gods, their reward for ascetic practices. Odd ones among those women sang in low and in high voices. Some pulled lotuses apart, playfully. Others in the same vein danced, bristling with mutual delight, limbs making exotic gestures, breasts perturbing pearl necklaces. Here, having first accepted the price in austerities, and made the decision to splash out on heaven, ascetics rich in austerities have their weary minds enthralled by the flirting apsarases. The faces of some of these women, earrings a-tremble, peeped through chinks in the undergrowth, like duck-dunked lotuses, peeping through scattered and displaced leaves. When he saw them emerging from their forest niches like ribbons of lightning from rain clouds, Nanda's body trembled with passion, like moonlight on rippling water. Their heavenly form and playful gestures he then mentally seized, and, while his eye was appropriated by curiosity, he became impassioned, as if from a thirst for union. He became thirsty, desirous of drinking up the Apsarases, afflicted by a pervading itch to have them. Dragged along by the mind chariot, whose horse is the restless power of the senses, he could not come to stillness. For just as a man adds soda ash to dirty clothes, and thereby makes them even dirtier, not in order to increase dirt, but in order to remove it, so the sage had stirred the dust of passion in Nanda. Again, just as a healer who wishes to draw faults from the body would endeavour to aggravate those faults, so, wishing to kill the red taint of passion in him, the sage brought about an even greater passion. Just as a light in the dark is extinguished by the thousand-rayed brightness of the rising sun, so the lovely radiance of women in the human world is put in the shade by the brilliance of the celestial nymphs. Great beauty blots out lesser beauty. A loud noise drowns out a small noise, and a severe pain kills a mild pain. Every great stimulus tends towards the extinction of a minor one. And Nanda was able, relying on the power of the sage, to endure that sight unendurable to others. For the mind of a man lacking dispassion, when he was weak, would be burned up by the Apsarase's shining splendour. Deeming then that Nanda was roused to a new height of passion, his passion having turned from love of his wife, 
and desiring to fight passion with passion, the dispassionate sage spoke these words. Look at these women who dwell in heaven, and, having observed, truly tell the truth. Do you think more of these women with their lovely form and excellent attributes, or the one upon whom your mind has been set? So, letting his gaze settle upon the Apsarases, burning in his innermost heart with a fire of passion, and stammering with a mind stuck on objects of desire, Nanda joined his hands like a beggar and spoke. Whatever difference there might be, Master, between that one-eyed she-monkey and your sister-in-law is the same when your poor sister-in-law is set against the lovely Apsarases. For, just as previously when I beheld my wife, I had no interest in other women, so, now, when I behold their beauty, I have no interest in her. Just as somebody who had been pained by mild sunshine might be consumed by a great fire, so I who was previously toasted by a mild passion am now roasted by this blaze of passion. Therefore pour on me the water of your voice before I am burned, as was the fish's foe for a fire of passion is going now to burn me up, like a fire rising up to burn both undergrowth and treetops. Please, O sage, firm as the earth, I am sinking. Liberate me, who am without firmness. I shall give up my life, O man of liberated mind, unless you extend to a dying man the deathless nectar of your words. For a snake whose coils are calamity, whose eyes are destruction, whose fangs are madness, whose fiery venom is dark ignorance, the snake of love has bitten me in the heart. Therefore, great healer, supply the antidote. For nobody bitten by this snake of love remains anything but unsettled in himself. Bewildered was the mind of Vordu, whose essence had been immovability, while good body Shantanu, who had been a sensible man, grew gaunt. In you who abides conspicuously in the state of refuge, I seek refuge, so that I do not wander through this world, loafing in this place and that place, so that I might come to and then go beyond that abode which is my adversity ending end. Please, repeatedly I plead that you help me. Desiring to dispel that darkness in his heart, like the moon dispersing the darkness that rises by night, then spoke the moon of great seers, the disperser of the world's darkness, the one devoid of darkness, Gautama. Embrace firmness, shake off indecision, get a grip of hearing and of heart, and listen. If you desire these women, Practice now the utmost asceticism to pay their price. For these women are conquered neither by force nor by service, neither by gifts nor by good looks. They are mastered just by Dharma conduct. If aroused, practice Dharma diligently. Perching here in heaven, 
with gods, delightful forests, ageless women. Such is the fruit of your own pure action. It is not conferred by another, nor is it without cause. Through strenuous efforts on earth, drawing a bow and such like, a man may sometimes win women, or else he may not. But what is certain is that, through his practice of Dharma here and now, these women in heaven can belong to a man of meritorious action. So delight in restraint, being attentive and ready, if you desire to secure the Apsarases. And I guarantee that in so far as you persist in your observance, you certainly shall be one with them. From now on, I will, he agreed. Believing intently in the Supreme Sage, he had become extremely determined. Then the Sage, gliding down from the sky like the wind, brought him back down again to earth. The Tenth Canto in the epic poem Handsome Nanda, titled A Vision of Heaven.
And so, having gazed upon those women who wander in the gladdening gardens of Nandana, Nanda tethered the fickle and unruly mind to a tethering post of restraint. Failing to relish the taste of freedom from care, sapless as a wilting lotus, he went through the motions of Dharma practice, having installed the Apsarases already in his heart. Thus did one whose sense power had been restless, whose senses had grazed on the pasture of his wife, come by the very power of sense objects to have his sense power reined in. Adept in the practices of love, confused about the practices of a beggar, set firm by the best of practice guides, Nanda did the devout practice of abstinence. Stifling restraint and ardent love, like water and fire in tandem, smothered him and burned him dry. Though naturally good-looking, he became extremely ugly, both from agonising about the Apsarases and from protracted restraint. Even when mention was made of his wife, he who had been so devoted to his wife stood by, seemingly bereft of passion. He neither bristled nor quavered. Knowing him to be adamant, turned away from passion for his wife, Ananda, having come that way, said to Nanda with affection, Ah, this is a beginning that befits an educated and well-born man. Since you are holding back the power of your senses and, abiding in yourself, you are set on restraint. In one entangled in desires, in a man of passion, a sensualist, that such consciousness has arisen, this is by no small cause. A mild illness is warded off with little effort. A serious illness is cured with serious efforts, or else it is not. An illness of the mind is hard to remove, and yours was a powerful one. If you are rid of it, you are in every way steadfast. For an ignoble man, good is hard to do. For an arrogant man, it is hard to be meek. For a greedy man, giving is hard. And hard for a man of passion is the practice of devout abstinence. But I have one doubt concerning this steadfastness of yours in restraint. I would like assurance on this matter, if you think fit to tell me. Straight talk should not be taken amiss. However harsh it is, so long as its intention is pure, a good man will not retain it as harsh. For there is disagreeable good advice, which is kind, and there is agreeable bad advice, which is not kind. But advice that is both agreeable and good is as hard to come by as medicine that is both sweet and salutary. Trust, acting in the other's interest, sharing of joy and sorrow, and tolerance as well as affection. Such between good men is the conduct of a friend. So now I am going to speak to you out of affection, with no wish to hurt. For my intention is to speak of that better way for you, 
in regard to which I ought not to be indifferent. You are practising Dharma, so they say, for celestial nymphs as wages. Is that so? Is it true? Such a thing would be a joke. If this really is true, I will tell you a medicine for it. Or if it is the impertinence of chatterers, then that dust I shall expose. Then, though it was tenderly done, Nanda was stricken in his heart. After reflecting, he drew in a long breath and his face inclined slightly downward. And so, knowing the signs that betrayed the set of Nanda's mind, Ananda spoke words which were disagreeable, but sweet in consequence. I know from the look on your face what your motive is in practising Dharma, and knowing that there arises in me towards you laughter, and at the same time pity. Like somebody who, with a view to sitting on it, carried around on his shoulder a heavy rock. That is how you, with a view to sensuality, are labouring to bear restraint. Just as, in its desire to charge, a wild ram draws back, so, for the sake of non-abstinence, is this Ahem, devout abstinence of yours. Just as merchants buy merchandise, moved by a desire to make profit, that is how you are practising Dharma, as if it were a tradable commodity, not for the sake of peace. Just as, with a particular crop in view, a ploughman scatters seed. That is how, because of being desperate for an object, you have renounced objects. Just as a man who craves some pleasurable remedy might want to be ill, that is how, in your thirst for an object, you are seeking out suffering. Just as a man sees honey and fails to notice a precipice, that is how you are seeing the heavenly nymphs and not seeing the fall that will come in the end. Blazing with a fire of desire in your heart, you carry out observances with your body. What is this devout abstinence of yours? who does not practice abstinence with his mind. Again, since in spiralling through samsara, you have gained celestial nymphs and left them a hundred times over, what is this yearning of yours for those women? A fire is not satisfied by dry brushwood nor the salty ocean by water, nor a man of thirst by his desires. Desires, therefore, do not make for satisfaction. Without satisfaction, whence peace? Without peace, whence ease? Without ease, whence joy? Without joy, whence enjoyment? Therefore, if you want enjoyment, let your mind be directed within. Tranquil and impeccable is enjoyment of the inner self, and there is no enjoyment to equal it. In it, you have no need of musical instruments or women or ornaments. On your own, wherever you are, you can indulge in that enjoyment. The mind suffers 
mightily as long as thirst persists. Eradicate that thirst. For suffering coexists with thirst or else does not exist. In prosperity or in adversity, by day or by night. For the man who thirsts after desires, peace is not possible. The pursuit of desires is full of suffering, and attainment of them is not where satisfaction lies. The separation from them is inevitably sorrowful, but the celestial constant is separation. Even having done action that is hard to do, and reached a heaven that is hard to reach, a man comes right back to the world of men, as if to his own house after a spell away. The backslider, when his residual good has run out, finds himself among the animals, or in the world of the departed, or else he goes to hell. Having enjoyed in heaven the utmost sensual objects, he falls back, beset by suffering. What has that enjoyment done for him? Through tender love for living creatures, Shibi gave his own flesh to a hawk. He fell back from heaven, even after doing such a difficult deed. Having attained half of Indra's throne as a veritable earth lord of the old school, Mandatra, when his time with the gods elapsed, came back down again. Though he ruled the gods, Nahusha fell to earth. He turned into a snake, so they say, and even today has not riddled free. Likewise, King Ilivila, being perfect in kingly conduct, went to heaven and fell back down, becoming, so they say, a turtle in the ocean. Buri Dyumna and Yayati and other excellent kings, having bought heaven by their actions, gave it up again after that karma ran out. Whereas the Asuras, who had been gods in heaven when the Suras robbed them of their rank, went bemoaning their lost glory, down to their Partala lair. But why such sighting of royal seers, or of asuras, suras, and the like? Mighty Indras have fallen in their hundreds. Even the most exalted position is not secure. Again, Indra's luminous sidekick, he of the three strides, lit up Indra's court. And yet, when his karma waned, he fell to earth from the Apsarase's midst, screaming, Oh, the grove of Chitrarata! Oh, the pond! Oh, the heavenly Ganges! Oh, my beloved! Thus lament, the distressed denizens of heaven as they fall to earth. For intense already is the pain that arises in those facing death in this world. And how much worse is it for the pleasure addicts when they finally fall from heaven? Their clothes gather dust, their glorious garlands wither, Sweat appears on their limbs, and in their sitting there is no enjoyment. These are the first signs of the imminent fall from heaven of sky-dwellers. 
like the unwelcome but sure signs of the approaching death of those subject to dying. When the pleasure that arises from enjoyment of desires in heaven is compared with the pain of falling, the pain assuredly is greater. Knowing heaven, therefore, to be ill-fated, precarious, unreliable, unsatisfactory and transitory, set your heart upon immunity from that circuit. For though he attained a peak experience of bodiless being, sage Udraka, at the expiration of his karma, will fall from that state into the womb of an animal. Through seven years of loving kindness, Sunetra went from here to Brahma's world, but he span around again and came back to live in a womb. Since heaven dwellers, even when all powerful, are subject to decay, what wise man would aspire to a decadent sojourn in heaven? For just as a bird tied to a string, though it has flown far, comes back again, so too do people return who are tied to the string of ignorance, however far they have travelled. A man, temporarily released from prison on bail, enjoys home comforts, and then, when his time is up, he must go back to prison. In the same way, through restrictive practices, beginning with meditation, a man gets to heaven as if on bail, and after enjoying those objects, which were his karmic reward, he eventually is dragged back down to earth. Fish in a pond who have swum into a net unwarily do not know the misfortune that results from capture, but contentedly move around in the water. In the same way, meditators in heaven, who are really of this world of men, think that they have achieved their end. And so they assume their own position to be favourable, secure and settled as they continue to whirl around. Therefore, see this world to be shot through with the calamities of birth, sickness and death. See it whether in heaven, among men, in hell, or among animals, or the departed, to be reeling through samsara. Seeing the world to be thus, for the sake of that fearless refuge, for that sorrowless nectar of immortality, which is benign and beyond death and decay, devoutly practice abstinence and abandon your fancy for a precarious heaven. The eleventh canto in the epic poem Handsome Nanda, titled Negation of Heaven. You are practicing Dharma to earn the Apsarasis as wages to be upbraided thus, as Nanda then was by Ananda, made him deeply ashamed. Because of the great shame, the exuberance in his heart was no more. His mind was downcast due to disenchantment and did not stick with practice. Though he was fixated on sensual love, and at the same time indifferent to ridicule, Nanda's motivation had matured to a point where neither could he disregard Ananda's words. Being 
of an unquestioning nature. He had presumed heaven to be a constant. So on learning that it was perishable, he was fiercely shocked. Turning back from heaven, the chariot of his mind, whose horse was willpower, was like a great chariot turned back from a wrong road by an attentive charioteer. After turning back from his thirst for heaven, he seemed suddenly to become well. He had given up something sweet that was bad for him, like a sick man finding the will to live. Just as he forgot about his beloved wife on seeing the Apsaraces, so also, when startled by their impermanence, did he put the Apsaraces behind him. Even the greatest beings are subject to return. So he reflected, and from his shock, though given to redness, he seemed to blanch. It was for growth in him of a better way that the shock happened. Just as the verb to grow is listed after to happen in the lexicon recited by students of grammar. Because of his sensuality, however, his mind was by no means gripped by the kind of constancy which is shown in all three times by the received usage of the irregularity which is being. Trembling went he of mighty arm, like a top bull elephant through with rut. At a suitable moment he approached the guru, wishing to communicate his intention. After bowing his head to the guru, with eyes filled with tears, he joined the palms of his hands and spoke as follows, his face somewhat lowered, because of shame. For my gaining of the celestial nymphs, glorious one, you stand as guarantor. But for the nymphs I have no need. I relinquish your guarantee. For since I have heard of heaven's fleeting whirl and of the varieties of aimless wandering, neither among mortal beings nor among heavenly beings does doing appeal to me. If, after struggling to get to heaven through self-restriction and restraint, men fall at last unsatisfied, then homage to the heaven-bound who give up on the way. Now that I have seen through the whole world of man with its changeability and its fixity, it is the eradicator of all suffering, your most excellent Dharma, that I rejoice in. Therefore, in detail and in summary, could you please communicate it to me, O best of listeners, so that through listening I might come to the ultimate step. Then, knowing from where he was coming, and that, though his senses were set against it, a better way was now emerging. The realised one spoke. Aha! This gaining of a foothold is the harbinger of a higher good in you. As when a fire stick is rubbed, rising smoke is the harbinger of fire. Long carried off course by the restless horses of the senses, you have now set foot on a path with a clarity of vision that happily will not dim. Today your birth bears fruit. Your gain today is great. For though you know the taste of love, your mind is yearning for indifference. In this world which likes what is close to home, a fondness for non-doing is rare. For men shrink from the end of becoming 
like the puerile from the edge of a cliff. People think there might be no suffering, just happiness for me. And as they labour under this illusion, any respite from incessant suffering, they sense not as such, but as happiness. Upon whims which are transient and akin to enemies, forever causing suffering, upon things like love, the world is fixed. It does not know the happiness that is immune to change. But that deathless nectar which prevents all suffering, you have in your hands. It is an antidote which, having drunk poison, you are going in good time to drink. In its fear of worthless wandering, your intention is worthy of respect. For a fire of passion such as yours, O oh, you whose face is turned to Dharma, is being turned around. With a mind unbridled by lust, it is exceedingly difficult to be steadfast, as when a thirsty traveller sees dirty water. Obviously, the dust of passion was blocking the consciousness that is now awakening in you, like the dust of a sandstorm blocking the light of the sun. But now consciousness is blossoming forth, seeking to dispel darkness of the heart, like that sunlight spewed forth from Mount Meru, which dispels the darkness of night. And this indeed befits a soul whose essence is simplicity. That you should have confidence in a better way, which is ultimate and subtle. This wish for Dharma, therefore, you should nurture. For all Dharmas, O knower of Dharma, invariably have wishing as their cause. As long as the intention of moving is there, one mobilises for the act of moving. And with the intention of staying at rest, there is an act of staying at rest. With the intention of standing, likewise, there is standing up. When a man has confidence that there is water under the ground, and has need of water, then, with an effort of will, here the earth he digs. If a man had no need of fire, nor confidence that fire was in a fire stick, he would never twirl the stick. Those conditions being met, he does twirl the stick. Without the confidence that corn will grow in the soil he tills, or without the need for corn, the farmer would not sow seeds in the earth. And so I call this confidence the hand, because it is this confidence above all that grasps true Dharma, as a hand naturally takes a gift. From its primacy I describe it as sensory power, from its constancy as strength, and because it relieves poverty of virtue, I describe it as wealth. For its protection of Dharma, I call it the arrow. And from the difficulty of finding it in this world, I call it the jewel. Again, I call it the seed, since it is the cause of betterment. And for its cleansing action in the washing away of wrong, again I call it the river. Since in the arising of Dharma, confidence is the primary cause, 
Therefore I have named it after its effects. In this case like this, in that case like that. This shoot of confidence, therefore, you should nurture. When it grows, Dharma grows, as a tree grows with the growth of its root. When a person's seeing is disordered, when a person's sense of purpose is weak, the confidence of that person is unsteady, for he is not veering in the direction he should. So long as the real truth is not seen or heard, confidence does not become strong or firm. But when, through restraint, the power of the senses is subjugated and the real truth is realised, the tree of confidence bears fruit and weight. The Twelfth Canto in the epic poem Handsome Nanda, titled Gaining a Foothold. And so Nanda was affirmed by the great seer in the matter of confidence. He felt filled with the deepest joy, as if drenched in the deathless nectar. To the fully awakened Buddha, by virtue of that confidence, he seemed already to be a success, and to himself Having been initiated by the Buddha, he felt as though he had arrived already on the better path. Some in soothing tones, some with tough talk, some by both these means, he, the trainer, trained. Just as gold born from dirt is pure spotless, gleaming, and while lying in the dirt is not tarnished by the dirt's impurities. And just as a lotus leaf is born in water and remains in water, but neither above nor below is sullied by the water. So the sage, born in the world, and acting for the benefit of the world, because of his state of action and spotlessness, is not tainted by worldly things. Joining with others and leaving them, 
love and toughness, and talking as well as meditation itself. He used these means during his instruction for the purpose of healing, not to make a following for himself. Thus did the Benevolent One, out of his great compassion, take on a form by which he might release fellow living beings from suffering. Seeing then that by boosting Nanda he had made a receptacle, the best of speakers, the knower of processes, spoke of better ways as a process. Starting afresh from here, my friend, with the power of confidence leading you forward, in order to get to the nectar of deathlessness, you should watch the manner of your action. So that the use of body and voice becomes simple for you, make it expansive and open and guarded and free from disconnectedness. Expansive by reality's doing, open from not hiding, guarded because aimed at prevention, and unbroken through absence of fault. With regard for purity of body and voice, and with regard also for the sevenfold prohibition on bodily and vocal conduct. You should work to perfect a proper way of making a living on the grounds of integrity. On the grounds of not indulging the five faults beginning with hypocrisy. On the grounds of fleeing the four predators of practice such as astrology. On the grounds of not accepting things to be avoided, such as valuables linked to the needless killing of living creatures. On the grounds of accepting the established rules for begging with their definite limits. As a person who is contented, pristine and pleasant, you can, through making a living cleanly and well, counteract suffering all the way to liberation. Separately from overt action and from the origin of the use of body and voice, I have spoken of making a living, because it is so hard to make a pure one. For hard to be washed away is the view of a householder with his many and various concerns. And also hard to be kept pure is the livelihood of a beggar whose subsistence depends on others. Such is termed the discipline of integrity. In some it is conduct. Without it there could truly be no going forth nor state of being at home. Steeped in good conduct, therefore, lead this life of devout abstinence, and in what is even minutely blameworthy, see danger, being firm in your purpose. For founded on integrity, unfurl all actions on the better path just as events like standing unfold when a force resists the earth. Let it be grasped, my friend, that release is seated in dispassion, dispassion in conscious awareness, and conscious awareness in knowing and seeing. And let it be experienced again that the knowing is seated in a stillness and that the seat of the stillness is a body-mind at ease. An assurance on which sits ease of the body-mind 
is of the highest order, and the assurance is seated in enjoyment. Again, let this be realized in experience. The enjoyment is seated in a great happiness, which, similarly, is understood to be of the highest order. And the happiness is seated in a freedom from furrowing the heart over things done badly or not done. But the freedom of the mind from remorse is seated in pristine practice of integrity. Therefore, realizing that integrity comes first, purify the discipline of integrity. The discipline of integrity is so called because it comes out of repeated practice. Repeated practice comes out of devotion to training. Devotion to training comes out of direction in it. And direction comes out of submitting to that direction. For the discipline of integrity, my friend, is the refuge. It is like a guide in the wilderness. It is friend, kinsman and protector. It is wealth and it is strength. Since the discipline of integrity is such, my friend, you should work to perfect the discipline of integrity. Among those who practice, moreover, this is the stance taken in different endeavours whose aim is freedom. On this basis, standing grounded in awareness, you should hold back the naturally impetuous senses from the objects of those senses. There is less to fear from an enemy or from fire or from a snake or from lightning than there is from one's own senses, for through them one is forever being smitten. Some people, some of the time, are beleaguered by hateful enemies, or else they are not. Besieged through the senses are all people everywhere, all of the time. Nor does one go to hell when smitten by the likes of an enemy. But meekly is one pulled there, when smitten through the impetuous senses. The pain of being smitten by those others may occur in the heart, or else it may not. The pain of being oppressed through one's senses is a matter of the heart, and indeed of the body. For smeared with the poison of conceptions, are those arrows produced from five senses whose tails are anxiety, whose tips are thrills, and whose range is the vast emptiness of objects. Fired off by desire, the hunter, they strike human forms in the heart. Unless they are warded away, men wounded by them duly fall. Standing firm in the arena of restraint and bearing the bow of resolve, the mighty man, as they rain down, must fend them away, wearing the armour of awareness. From ebbing of the power of the senses, as if from subjugation of enemies, one sleeps or sits at ease, in joyful recreation, wherever one may be. For in the constant hankering of those senses after objects in the world, there occurs out of that ignominy no more consciousness than there is in the hoping of hounds. A cluster of sense organs is no more sated by objects than is the ocean even when constantly filled by water.
It is necessarily through the senses, each in its own sphere, that one must function in this world. But not to be seized upon in that realm is an objectified image or any secondary sexual sign. On seeing a form with your eye, you are contained in the sum of the elements. The conception that it is a woman or it is a man, you should not frame. If a notion of woman or man does intrude at any time in relation to anyone, upon hair, teeth and the rest, for their beauty, you should not dwell. Nothing then is to be taken away and nothing is to be added. The reality is to be investigated as it really is, whatever and however it is. In your observing what is, like this, always in the territory of the senses, there will be no foothold for longing and dejection. Longing, using cherished forms, smites the sensual masses. A foe who has a friendly face She's fair of speech and foul of heart. Conversely, what is called dejectedness is, in connection with an object, a contrary reaction by going along with which, in one's ignorance, one is smitten hereafter and smitten here and now. When, by getting and not getting his way, a man is pained, as if by cold or heat, he finds no refuge, nor arrives on a better path. Hence the unsteady sense power of the masses. And yet the power of the senses, though operative, need not become glued to an object, so long as in the mind, with regard to that object, no conceptualization goes on. Just as a fire burns only where fuel and air coexist, so a fire of affliction arises from an object and the forming of a conception. For through an illusory fixed conception one is bound to an object. Seeing that very same object as it really is, one is set free. On seeing one and the same form, this man is enamoured, that man is disgusted, somebody else remains in the middle, while yet another feels thereto a human warmth. Thus, an object is not the cause of bondage or of liberation. It is due to peculiar fixed conceptions that attachment arises or does not. Through effort of the highest order, therefore, contain the power of the senses. For unguarded senses make for suffering and for becoming. Therefore, towards those mischief-making foes, seeing, smelling, hearing, tasting and feeling, show in every situation a vigilance born of restraint. In this matter you are not for an instant to be heedless. The Thirteenth Canto in the epic poem Handsome Nanda, titled Defeating the Power of the Senses Through the Discipline of Integrity.
And so, using the floodgate of awareness to close a dam on the power of the senses, know the measure in eating food that conduces to meditation and to health. For it depresses in-breath and out-breath and brings tiredness and sleepiness when food is taken in excess. It also destroys enterprise. And just as eating too much conduces to a dearth of value, so eating too little makes for a lack of efficacy. Of its substance, luster and stamina, of its usefulness and its very strength, a meagre diet deprives the body. Just as a weighing scale bends down with a heavy weight, bends upwards with a light one and stays in balance with the right one, so does this body according to intake of food. Therefore food is to be eaten, each reflecting on his own energy, and none apportioning himself too much or too little under the influence of pride. For the fire of the body is damped down when it is burdened by a heavy load of food, like a small blaze suddenly covered with a big heap of firewood. Excessive fasting also is not recommended, for one who does not eat is extinguished like a fire without fuel. Since without food there is none that survives among those that bear breath, therefore eating food is not a sin, but being choosy in this area is prohibited. For on no other single object are sentient beings so stuck as on the heedless eating of food. To the reason for this, one must be awake. Just as one who is wounded for the purpose of healing puts ointment on a wound, so does one who wills freedom for the purpose of staving off hunger eat food. Just as, in order to ready it for bearing a burden, one greases a wagon's axle, so in order to journey through life does the wise man utilize food. And just as two travellers, in order to cross a wasteland, might feed upon the flesh of a child, though grievously pained to do so, as its mother and father. So food should be eaten, consciously, neither for display nor for appearance, neither to excite hilarity nor to feed extravagance. Food is provided for the upkeep of the body, as if to prop before it falls a dilapidated house. Just as somebody might take pains to build and then carry a raft, not because he is so fond of it, but because he means to cross a great flood. So too, by various means, do men of insight sustain the body, not because they are so fond of it, but because they mean to cross a flood of suffering. Just as a king under siege yields in sorrow to a rival king, not out of devotion nor through thirsting, but solely to safeguard life, so the devotee of practice tenders food to his body, solely to stave off hunger, neither with passion nor as devotion. Having passed the day self-possessed through maintenance of the mind, you may be able, shaking off sleep, to spend the night time too in a state of practice. 
since even when you are conscious, sleep might be holding out in your heart. Consciousness properly revealing itself is nothing to be sure about. Initiative, constancy, inner strength and courage are the elements always to bear in mind while you are being oppressed by sleep. Recite clearly those Dharma teachings that you have learnt. Point others in their direction and think them out for yourself. Wet the face with water. Look around in all directions and glance at the stars, wanting always to be awake. By the means of inner senses that are not impetuous, but in a state of subjection. By the means of a mind that is not scattered, walk up and down at night, or else sit. In fear, in joy, and in grief, one does not succumb to sleep. Therefore, against the onslaughts of sleep, resort to these three. Feel fear from death's approach, joy from grasping a teaching of Dharma, and from the boundless suffering inherent in a birth, feel the grief. Such a step may need to be taken, my friend, in the direction of being awake. For what wise man, out of sleep, makes a wasted life? To neglect the reptilian faults, as if ignoring snakes in the house, and thus to slumber on, does not befit a man of wisdom who wishes to overcome the great terror. For while the world of the living burns with the fires of death, disease and ageing, who could lie down insensibly any more than in a burning house? Therefore, knowing it to be darkness, you should not let sleep enshroud you while the faults remain unquieted, like sword-wielding enemies. But, having spent the first of the three night watches actively engaged in practice, you should, as one who is pulling his own strings, go to bed to rest the body. On your right side, then, remaining conscious of light, thinking in your heart of wakefulness, you might, with peace of mind, fall asleep. Again, by getting up in the third watch and going into movement, or indeed just sitting, you might renew your practice with mind refreshed and power of the senses curbed. And so, upon acts like sitting, moving, standing, looking and speaking, being fully aware of every action, you should bring mindfulness to bear. When a man, like a gatekeeper at his gate, is cocooned in vigilance, the faults do not venture to attack him, any more than enemies would attack a guarded city. No affliction arises in him for whom awareness pervades the body, guarding the mind in all situations as a nurse protects a child. But he is a target for the faults who lacks the armour of mindfulness. As for enemies is he who stands in battle with no suit of armour. Know to be vulnerable that mind which vigilance does not guard. Like a blind man without a guide, 
groping after objects. When men attach to meaningless aims and turn away from their proper aims, failing to shudder at the danger, loss of mindfulness is the cause. Again, when each virtue, beginning with integrity, is standing on its own patch, mindfulness goes after those virtues like a herdsman rounding up his scattered cows. The deathless nectar is lost to him whose awareness dissipates. The nectar exists in the hands of him for whom awareness pervades the body. Where is the noble principle of a man who lacks awareness? And for whom no noble principle exists, to him a true path has been lost. He who has lost the right track has lost the deathless step. Having lost that nectar of deathlessness, he is not exempt from suffering. Therefore, walking with the awareness that I am walking, and standing with the awareness that I am standing, upon such moments as these, you should bring mindfulness to bear. In this manner, my friend, repair to a place suited for practice, free of people and free of noise a place for lying down and sitting. For by first achieving solitude of the body, it is easy to obtain solitude of the mind. The man of redness, the tranquillity of his mind unrealized, who does not take to a playground of solitude, is injured as though, unable to regain a track, he is walking on very thorny ground. For a seeker who fails to see reality, but stands in the tawdry playground of objects, it is no easier to rein in the mind than to drive a foraging bull away from corn. But just as a bright fire dies down when not fanned by the wind, so too in solitary places does an unstirred mind easily come to quiet. One who eats anything at any place and wears any clothes, who dwells in enjoyment of his own being, and loves to be anywhere without people. He is to be known as a success, a knower of the taste of peace and ease, whose mind is made up. He avoids involvement with others like a thorn. If, in a world that delights in duality and is at heart distracted by objects, he roves in solitude, free of duality, a man of action, his heart at peace. Then he drinks the essence of wisdom as if it were the deathless nectar, and his heart is filled. Separately, he sorrows for the clinging, object-needy world. If he constantly abides as a unity in an empty abode, if he is no fonder of arisings of affliction than he is of enemies, and if, going rejoicing in the self, he drinks the water of joy, then greater than dominion over thirty gods is the happiness he enjoys. The fourteenth canto of the epic poem Handsome Nanda 
titled Stepping into Action. In whatever place of solitude you are, cross the legs in the supreme manner and align the body so that it tends straight upward. Thus attended by awareness that is directed towards the tip of the nose or towards the forehead or in between the eyebrows, let the inconstant mind be fully engaged with the fundamental. If some desirous idea, a fever of the mind, should venture to offend you, entertain no scent of it, but shake it off as if pollen had landed on your robe. Even if, as a result of calm consideration, you have let go of desires, you must as if shining light into darkness, abolish them by means of their opposite. What lies behind those desires sleeps on like a fire covered with ashes. You are to extinguish it, my friend, by the means of mental development, as if using water to put out a fire. For from that source they re-emerge, like shoots from a seed. In its absence they would be no more, like shoots in the absence of a seed. See how acquisition and other troubles stem from the desires of men of desire. And on that basis cut off at their root those troubles, which are akin to enemies calling themselves friends. Fleeting desires, desires which bring privation, flighty desires which are the causes of wagging to and fro, and common desires, are to be dealt with like poisonous snakes, the chasing of which leads to trouble, the keeping of which does not conduce to peace, and the losing of which makes for great anguish. Securing them does not bring contentment. Satisfaction through extraordinary wealth, success through the gaining of paradise, and happiness born from desires he who sees these things comes to nothing. Pay no heed to the changeable, unformed, insubstantial and ungrounded desires which are presumed to bring happiness. Being here and now, you need pay no heed to those desires. If hatred or cruelty should stir up your mind, let it be charmed by their opposite, as turbid water is by a jewel. Know their opposite to be kindness and compassion, for this opposition is forever like brightness and darkness. He in whom wrongdoing has been given up and yet hatred carries on, hits himself with dust, like an elephant after a good bath. Upon mortal beings who are pained by sickness, dying, ageing and the rest, what noble person with human warmth would lay the utmost pain? Again, a tainted mind here and now may or may not trouble the other, but instantly burned up in this moment is the mind of the man of tainted consciousness himself. On this basis, towards all beings, 
It is kindness and compassion, not hatred or cruelty, that you should opt for. For whatever a human being continually thinks, in that direction, through habit, the mind of this person veers. Therefore, disregarding what is not helpful, focus on what is helpful, which might be valuable for you here and now, and might be for the reaching of ultimate value. For unhelpful thoughts carried in the heart densely grow, producing in equal measure nothing of value for the self and for the other. Because they make obstacles on the better path, they lead to the falling apart of the self, and because they undermine the worthy condition, they lead to the falling apart of the other's trust. Concentration during activities of the mind you should certainly practice too. But above all, my friend, nothing unhelpful should you think. That anxious thought of enjoying the three desires which churns in the mind does not meet with merit but produces bondage. Tending to cause offence to living beings and torment for oneself, disturbed thinking becomes delusion and leads to hell. With unhelpful thought, therefore, you should not mar yourself, which is a good sword and bejeweled, as if you were digging the earth and getting spattered with mud. Just as an ignoramus might burn as firewood the best aloes, so wrong-headedly would one waste this state of being human. Again, just as he might leave the jewel and carry away from the jewel island a clod, so would one leave the dharma that leads to happiness and think evil. Just as he might go to the Himalayas and eat not herbs but poison, so would one arrive at being a human being and do not good but harm. Being awake to this, you must see off thought by antagonistic means, as if using a finely honed counter wedge to drive a wedge from a cleft in a log. Again, should there be anxiety about whether or not your family is prospering, investigate the nature of the world of the living in order to put a stop to it. Among beings dragged by our own doing through the cycle of samsara, who are our own people and who are other people? It is through ignorance that people attach to people. For one who turned on a bygone road into a relative is a stranger to you, and a stranger on a road to come will become your relative. Just as birds in the evening flock together at separate locations, so is the mingling over many generations of one's own and other people. Just as under any old roof, travellers shelter together and then go again their separate ways. So are relatives joined. In this originally shattered world, nobody is the beloved of anybody. Held together by cause and effect, humankind is like sand in a clenched fist. For mother cherishes son 
thinking, He will keep me. And son honours mother, thinking, She bore me in her womb. As long as relatives act agreeably towards each other, they engender affection. But otherwise, it is enmity. A close relation is demonstrably unfriendly. A stranger proves to be a friend. By the different things they do, folk break and make affection. Just as an artist, all by himself, might fall in love with a woman he painted, so each generating attachment by himself do people become attached to one another. That relation, who in another life was so dear to you, what use to you is he? What use to him are you? With thoughts about close relatives, therefore, you should not enshroud the mind. There is no abiding difference in the flux of samsara between one's own people and people in general. That country is an easy place to live. That one is well provisioned. That one is happy. If there should arise any such idea in you, you are to give it up, my friend, and not entertain it in any way, knowing the whole world to be ablaze with the manifold fires of the faults. Again, from the turning of the circle of the seasons, and from hunger, thirst and fatigue, Everywhere suffering is the rule, not somewhere is happiness found. Here cold, there heat, here disease, there danger, oppress humanity in the extreme. The world, therefore, has no place of refuge. Aging, sickness and death are the great terror of this world. There is no place where that terror does not arise. Where this body goes, there suffering follows. There is no way in the world going on which one is not afflicted. Even an area that is pleasant, abundant in provisions and safe, should be regarded as a deprived area where burn the fires of affliction. In this world beset by hardships physical and mental, there is no cosy place to which one might go and be at ease. While suffering, everywhere and for everyone, continues at every moment, you are not to enthuse, my friend, over the world's shimmering images. When your enthusiasm is turned back from all that, the whole living world you will deem to be, as it were, on fire. Any idea you might have then that has to do with not dying is, with an effort of will, to be obliterated as a disorder of your whole being. Not a moment of trust is to be placed in life. For like a tiger lying in wait, time slays the unsuspecting. That I am young or I am strong should not occur to you. Death kills in all situations without regard for sprightliness. As he drags about that field of misfortunes which is a body, expectations of well-being or of continuing life 
do not arise in one who is observant. Who could be complacent carrying around a body, a receptacle for the elements, which is like a basket full of snakes, each opposed to another? But a man draws breath and next time around breathes in again, no to be a wonder. For staying alive is nothing to breathe easy about. Here is another wonder, that one who was asleep wakes up, or, having been up, goes back to sleep. For many enemies has the owner of a body. He who stalks humankind, from the womb onwards, with murderous intent. Who can breathe easy about him, death? poised like an enemy with sword upraised. No man born into the world, however endowed with learning and power, ever defeats death, maker of ends, nor has ever defeated him, nor ever will defeat him. For cajoling, bribing, dividing, or the use of force or restraint, when impetuous death has arrived, are powerless to beat him back. So place no trust in teetering life, for time is always carrying it off, and does not wait for old age. Seeing the world to be without substance, as fragile as a water bubble. What man of sound mind could harbour the notion of not dying? So, for the giving up, in short, of all these ideas, mindfulness of inward and outward breathing, my friend, you should make into your own possession. Using this device, you should take, in good time, countermeasures against ideas, like remedies against illnesses. A dirt washer in pursuit of gold washes away first the coarse grains of dirt, then the finer granules, so that the material is cleansed, and by the cleansing he retains the rudiments of gold. In the same way, a man whose mind is poised in pursuit of liberation lets go first of the gross faults, then of the subtler ones, so that his mind is cleansed, and by the cleansing he retains the rudiments of Dharma. Just as gold washed with water, is separated from dirt in this world, methodically. And just as the smith heats the gold in the fire and repeatedly turns it over, just so is the practitioner's mind, with delicacy and accuracy, separated from faults in this world. And just so, after cleansing it from afflictions, does the practitioner temper the mind and collect it. Again, just as the smith brings gold to a state where he can work it easily, in as many ways as he likes, into all kinds of ornaments, so too a beggar of cleansed mind tempers his mind, and directs his yielding mind among the powers of knowing, as he wishes and wherever he wishes. The fifteenth canto in the epic poem Handsome Nanda, titled Abandoning Ideas. 
Thus, by methodically taking possession of the mind, getting rid of something and gathering something together, the practitioner makes the four dhyanas his own and duly acquires the five powers of knowing. The principal transcendent power taking many forms, then being awake to what others are thinking, and remembering past lives from long ago, and divine lucidity of ear and of eye. From then on, through investigation of what is, he applies his mind to eradicating the polluting influences. For on this basis he fully understands suffering and the rest, the four true standpoints. This is suffering, which is constant and akin to trouble. This is the cause of suffering, akin to starting it. This is cessation of suffering, akin to walking away. And this, akin to a refuge, is a peaceable path. Understanding these noble truths by a process of reasoning, while getting to know the four as one, he prevails over all pollutants by the means of mental development and on finding peace is no longer subject to becoming. For by failing to wake up and come round to this four whose substance is the reality of what is, humankind goes from existence to existence without finding peace, hoisted in the swing of samsara. Therefore, at the root of a tragedy like a growing old, see, in short, that birth is suffering. For as the earth supports the life of all plants, this birth is the field of all troubles. The birth of a sentient bodily form, again, is the birth of suffering in all its varieties. And he who begets such an outgrowth is the begetter of death and of disease. Good food or bad food, if mixed with poison, makes for ruin and not for sustenance. Likewise, whether in a world on the flat, or above, or below, all birth makes for hardship, and not for ease. The many and various disappointments of men, like old age, occur as long as their doing goes on. For even when violent winds blow, Trees do not shake that never sprouted. As wind is born from the air, as fire sleeps in the womb of shami wood, and as water gestates inside the earth, so does suffering spring from an expectant mind and body. The fluidity of water, the solidity of earth, the motion of wind and the constant heat of fire are innate in them, as also it is in the nature of both the body and the mind to suffer. In so far as there is a body, there is the suffering of sickness, ageing and so on, and also of hunger and thirst and of the rains and summer heat and winter cold. In so far as a mind is bonded, tied to phenomena, 
there is the suffering of grief, discontent, anger, fear and so on. Seeing now before your eyes that birth is suffering, recognize that likewise in the past it was suffering. And just as that was suffering and this is suffering, know that likewise in the future it will be suffering. For just as it is evident to us now what kind of thing a seed is, we can infer that it was so in the past and that it will be so in the future. And just as fire burning before us is hot, so was it hot and so will it be hot. In conformity with its kind then, a distinguishable bodily form develops. Wherein, O man of noble conduct, suffering exists right there. For nowhere else will suffering exist, or has it existed, or could it exist. And this, the suffering of doing, in the world, has its cause in clusters of faults which start with thirsting. The cause is certainly not in God, nor in primordial matter, nor in time, nor even in one's inherent constitution, nor in predestination or self-will. Again, you must understand how, due to this cause, because of men's faults, the cycle of doing goes on, so that they succumb to death who are afflicted by the dust of the passions and by darkness. But he is not reborn who is free of dust and darkness. In so far as the specific desire exists to do this or that, an action like going or sitting happens. Hence, in just the same way, by the force of their thirsting, living creatures are reborn, as is to be observed. See sentient beings in the grip of attachment dead set on pleasure among their own kind. And from their habitual practice of faults, observe them presenting with those very faults. Just as the anger, lust and so on of sufferers of those afflictions give rise in the present to a personality trait, so too in new lives, in various manifestations, does the affliction-created trait develop. In a life dominated by anger arises violent anger. In the lover of passion arises burning passion. And in one dominated by ignorance arises overwhelming ignorance. In one who has a lesser fault, again, the lesser fault develops. Seeing what fruit is before one's eyes, one knows, from past knowledge of that fruit, the seed it was in the past. And having identified a seed before one's eyes, one knows the fruit it may be in the future. In whichever realms of existence a man has ended faults, thanks to that dispassion he is not born in those realms. Wherever he remains susceptible to a fault, that is where he makes his appearance, whether he likes it or not. So, my friend, with regard to the many forms of becoming, 
know their causes to be the faults that start with thirsting and cut out those faults if you wish to be freed from suffering for ending of the effect follows from eradication of the cause again the ending of suffering follows from the disappearance of its cause experience that reality for yourself as peace and well-being a place of rest a cessation an absence of the red taint of thirsting a primeval refuge which is irremovable and noble in which there is no becoming no aging no dying no illness no being touched by unpleasantness no disappointment and no separation from what is pleasant it is an ultimate and indestructible step in which to dwell at ease a lamp that has gone out reaches neither to the earth nor to the sky nor to any cardinal nor to any intermediate point because its oil is spent it reaches nothing but extinction in the same way a man of action who has come to quiet reaches neither to the earth nor to the sky nor to any cardinal nor to any intermediate point from the ending of his afflictions he attains nothing but extinction a means for gaining that end is the path of threefold wisdom and twofold tranquillity it is to be cultivated by a wakeful person working to principle abiding in untainted threefold integrity using the voice well and the body well in tandem and making a clean living in a suitable manner these three pertaining to conduct are for the mastery based on integrity of one's Dharma duty noble insight into suffering and the other truths along with thinking straight and initiative these three pertaining to know-how are for dissolution based on wisdom of the afflictions true mindfulness properly harnessed so as to bring one close to the truth and true balance these two pertaining to practice are for mastery based on tranquility of the mind integrity no more propagates the shoots of affliction than a bygone spring propagates shoots from seeds the faults as long as a man's integrity is untainted venture only timidly to attack his mind but balance casts off the afflictions like a mountain casts off the mighty torrents of rivers the faults do not attack a man who is standing firm in balanced stillness like charmed snakes they are spellbound and wisdom destroys the faults without trace as a mountain stream in the monsoon destroys the trees on its banks faults consumed by it do not stand a chance like trees in the fiery wake of a thunderbolt giving oneself 
to this path with its three divisions and eight branches. This straightforward, irremovable, noble path. One abandons the faults which are the causes of suffering and comes to that step which is total well-being. Attendant on it are constancy and straightness, modesty, attentiveness and reclusiveness, wanting little, contentment and freedom from forming attachments. No fondness for worldly activity and forbearance. For he who knows suffering as it really is, who knows its starting and its stopping, it is he who reaches peace by the noble path, going along with friends in the good. He who fully appreciates his illness as the illness it is, who sees the cause of the illness and its remedy. It is he who wins before long freedom from disease, attended by friends in the know. So, with regard to the truth of suffering, see suffering as an illness. With regard to the faults, see the faults as the cause of the illness. With regard to the truth of stopping, see stopping as freedom from disease. And with regard to the truth of a path, see a path as a remedy. Comprehend, therefore, that suffering is doing. Witness the faults impelling it forward. Realize its stopping as non-doing and know the path as a turning back. Though your head and clothes be on fire, direct your mind so as to be awake to the truths. For in failing to see the purport of the truth, the world has burned, it is burning now, and it will burn. When a man sees a separate bodily form as decrepit, that insight of his is accurate. In seeing accurately, he is disenchanted. And from the ending of exuberance ends the red taint of passion. By the ending of the duality, which is exuberance and gloom, I submit, his mind is fully set free. And when his mind is fully liberated from that duality, there is nothing further for him to do. For in him who sees a separate bodily form as it is, and who sees its origin and passing away, from the very fact of his knowing and seeing, I predict the complete eradication of the pollutants. So, my friend, garner your energy greatly and strive quickly to put an end to polluting influences, examining in particular the elements as suffering, as impermanent and as devoid of self. For in knowing the six elements of earth, water, fire and the rest, generically and each as specific to itself, he who knows nothing else but those elements knows total release from those elements. One set on abandoning the afflictions, then, should attend to timing and method. 
for even practice itself, done at the wrong time and relying on wrong means, makes for disappointment and not for the desired end. If a cow is milked before her calf is born, milking at the wrong time will yield no milk. Or even at the right time, no milk will be got if, through ignorance, a cow is milked by the horn. Again, one who wants fire from damp wood, try as he might, will not get fire. And even if he lays down dry wood, he won't get fire from that with bad bushcraft. Having given due consideration to the time and place, as well as to the extent and method of one's practice, one should, reflecting on one's own strength and weakness, persist in an effort that is not inconsistent with them. That factor said to be garnering does not serve when the emotions are inflamed, for thus the mind does not come to quiet, like a fire being fanned by the wind. A factor ascertained to be calming has its time when one's mind is excited. For thus the mind subsides into quietness, like a blazing fire doused with water. A factor ascertained to bring calm does not serve when one's mind is dormant. For thus the mind sinks further into lifelessness, like a feeble fire left unfanned. A factor determined to be garnering has its time when one's mind is lifeless. For thus the mind becomes fit for work, like a feebly burning fire plied with fuel. Nor is equanimity a valid factor when one's mind is either lifeless or excited, for that might engender severe adversity, like the neglected illness of a sick man. A factor ascertained to conduce to equanimity has its time when one's mind is in its normal state. For thus one may set about work to be done, like a wagon setting off with well-trained horses. Again, when the mind is filled with the red joys of passion, direction towards oneself of loving kindness is not to be practised. For a passionate type is stupefied by love, like a sufferer from phlegm taking oil. Steadiness lies when the mind is excited by ardour, in resorting to an unpleasant factor. For thus a passionate type obtains relief, like a phlegmatic type taking an astringent. When the mind is wound up, however, with the fault of malice, unpleasantness is not the factor to be deployed. For unpleasantness is destructive to a hating type, as acid treatment is to a man of bilious nature. When the mind is agitated by the fault of malice, loving kindness should be cultivated by directing it towards oneself. For loving kindness is calming to a hate afflicted soul, as cooling treatment is to the man of bilious nature. 
when there is wandering of the mind, tied to delusion, both loving-kindness and unpleasantness are unsuitable. For a deluded man is further deluded by these two, like a windy type given an astringent. When working of the mind is delusory, one should appreciate the causality therein. For this is a path to peace when the mind is bewildered, like treating a wind condition with oil. Holding gold in the mouth of a furnace, a goldsmith in this world blows it at the proper time, douses it with water at the proper time, and gradually at the proper time he leaves it be. For he might burn the gold by blowing it at the wrong time. He might make it unworkable by plunging it into water at the wrong time. And he would not bring it to full perfection if at the wrong time he were just to leave it be. Likewise, for garnering, as also for calming, as also when appropriate for leaving well alone, one should readily attend to the appropriate factor because even diligence is destructive when accompanied by a wrong approach. Thus, on retreat from muddling through and on the principle to come back to, the one who went well spoke to Nanda. And knowing the varieties of behaviour, he detailed further the directions for abandoning ideas. Just as, for a disorder of bile, phlegm or wind, for whatever disorder of the humours has manifested the symptoms of disease, a doctor prescribes a course of treatment to cure that very disorder. So did the Buddha prescribe for the faults. It may not be possible, following a single method, to kill off bad ideas that habit has so deeply entrenched. In that case, one should commit to a second course, but never give up the good work. Because of the instinct-led accumulation from time without beginning, of the powerful mass of afflictions, and because true practice is so difficult to do, the faults cannot be cut off all at once. Just as a deep splinter, by means of the point of another sharp object, is removed by a man skilled in that task, likewise an unpromising stimulus may be dispensed with through deployment of a different stimulus. There again, because of your personal inexperience, a bad idea might not give way. You should abandon it by observing the fault in it, as a traveller abandons a path on which there is a wild beast. A man who wishes to live even when starving, declines to eat poisoned food. Likewise, observing that it brings with it a fault, a wise person leaves alone an unpleasant stimulus. When a man does not see a fault as a fault, who is able to restrain him from it? But when a man sees the good in what is good, he goes towards it despite being restrained. For those brought up well are ashamed of unpleasant occurrences going on in the mind. As one who is bright, young and good-looking is ashamed, 
of unsightly, ill-arranged objects hanging around his neck. If, though they are being shaken off, a trace persists of unhelpful thoughts, one should resort to different tasks, such as study or physical work, as a means of consigning those thoughts to oblivion. A clear-sighted person should even sleep or resort to physical exhaustion, but should never dwell on a bad stimulus, pending on which might be an adverse reaction. For just as a man afraid of thieves in the night would not open his door even to friends, so does a wise man withhold consent equally to the doing of anything bad or anything good that involves the faults. If, though fended off by such means, faults do not turn back, then, eliminated in order of their grossness, they must be driven out like impurities from gold. Just as a man who feels depressed following a torrid love affair takes refuge in activities like quick marching, so should a wise person proceed with regard to the faults. If their counter-agent cannot be found and unreal fancies do not subside, they must not for a moment be left unchecked. No whiff of them should be tolerated, as if they were snakes in the house. Grit tooth against tooth, if you will. Press the tongue forward and up against the palate, and grip the mind with the mind. Make an effort, but do not yield to them. Is it any wonder that a man without any delusions should not become deluded when he has contentedly repaired to the forest? But a man who is not shaken when challenged to the core by the stimuli of the aforementioned ideas, thoughts and fancies. He is a man of action. He is a steadfast man. So, in order to make the noble truths your own, first clear a path according to this plan of action. Like a king going on campaign to subdue his foes, wishing to conquer unconquered dominions. These salubrious wilds that surround us are suited to practice and not thronged with people. Furnishing the body with ample solitude, cut a path for abandoning the afflictions. Kaundinya, Nanda, Kurmila, Aniruda, Tishya, Upasena, Vimala, Radha, Vashpa, Uttara, Dautahi, Moha Raja, Katyayana, Dravya, Pilinda Vatsa, Padali, Padrayana, Sarpadasa, Subuti, Godata, Sujata, Vatsa, Sam Gramajit, Badrajit, Ashvajit, Shrona, and Sona Kotikarna, Kshema Ajita, the mothers of Nandaka and Nanda, Upali, Vagisha, Yashas, Yashoda, Mahavaya, Valkali, Rashtrapala, Sudarshana, Svagata, and 
Mexica. Capina. Kashapa of Uruvilva. The great Maha Kashapa. Tishya. Nanda. Purna and Purna, as well as Purnaka, and Purna Shona Paranta. The son of Sharadvati, Subahu, Chunda, Kondeya, Kapya, Burgu, Kuntadana, plus Shaivala. Revada, and Kaushtila, and he of the Maudgalya clan, and Gavampati. Be quick to show the courage that they have shown in their practice, working to principle. Then you will assuredly take the step that they took, and will realise the splendour that they realised. Just as a fruit may have flesh that is bitter to the taste, and yet is sweet when eaten ripe, so heroic effort, through the struggle it involves, is bitter, and yet, in accomplishment of the aim, its mature fruit is sweet. Directed energy is paramount, for in doing what needs to be done it is the foundation. Without directed energy, there is no accomplishment at all. All success in this world arises from directed energy. And in the absence of directed energy, wrongdoing is rampant. No gaining of what is yet to be gained and certain loss of what has been gained. Along with low self-esteem, wretchedness, the scorn of superiors, darkness, lack of spirit, and the breakdown of learning, restraint, and contentment. For men without directed energy, a great fall awaits. When a capable person hears the guiding principle, but realises no growth, when he knows the most excellent method, but realises no upward repose. When he leaves home, but in freedom realises no peace. The cause is the laziness in him, and not an enemy. A man obtains water if he digs the ground with unflagging exertion, and produces fire from fire sticks by continuous twirling. But those are sure to reap the fruit of their effort whose energies are harnessed to practice. For rivers that flow swiftly and constantly cut through even a mountain. After ploughing and protecting the soil with great pains, a farmer gains a bounteous crop of corn. After striving to plumb the ocean's waters, a diver revels in a bounty of coral and pearls. After seeing off with arrows the endeavour of rival kings, a king enjoys royal dominion. So direct your energy in pursuit of peace. For in directed energy undoubtedly lies all growth. The sixteenth canto in the epic poem Handsome Nanda, titled Exposition of the Noble Truths. Having thus had pointed out to him the path of what is, Nanda took that path of liberation. He bowed with his whole being before the Guru, and, 
with a view to abandoning the afflictions he made for the forest. There he saw a clearing, a quiet glade of soft, deep green grass, kept secret by a silent stream bearing water blue as beryl. Having washed his feet there, Nanda, by a clean, auspicious and splendid tree root, girded on the intention to come undone, and sat with legs fully crossed. By first directing the whole body up, and thus keeping his awareness turned towards the body, and thus integrating in his person all the senses. There he threw himself all out into practice. Wishing to practice on that basis the truth that has no gaps, and wishing to perform practices that would be favourable to release, he moved using mundane know-how and stillness into the stage of readying of consciousness. By holding firm, keeping direction of energy to the fore, by cutting out clinging and garnering his energy, with consciousness that was calmed and contained, he came back to himself and was not concerned about ends. Though his judgment had been tempered and his soul inspired, now a vestige of desire arising out of habit made his mind turbid, like lightning striking water in a monsoon. Being instantly aware of incompatibilities, he saw off that authoress of the Dharma's downfall, as a man whose mind is seized by anger shoes away a loved but excitable woman when he is trying to concentrate. Nanda redirected his energy in order to still his mind. But as he did so, an unhelpful thought reasserted itself, as when in a man intent on curing an illness, an acute symptom suddenly reappears. To fend against that, he turned skillfully to a different factor, one favourable to his practice, like an enfeebled prince who seeks out a powerful protector when being overthrown by a mighty rival. For just as, by laying out fortifications and laying down the rod of the law, by banding with friends and disbanding foes, a king gains hitherto ungained land, that is the very policy towards practice of one who desires release. Because for a practitioner whose desire is release, the mind is his fortress, know-how is his rod, the virtues are his friends, the faults are his foes, and liberation is the territory he endeavours to reach. Desiring release from the great net of suffering, desiring to enter into possession of the pathways of release, Desiring to experience the supreme, noble path, he got a bit of the eye and came to quiet. Heedless would be the unhoused man who, despite hearing the truth, housed the darkness of ignorance. But since Nanda was a man of the bowl, a receptacle for liberation, he had collected his mind into himself. On the grounds of their being held together, 
their causality and their inherent nature, on the grounds of their flavour and their concrete imperfection, and on the grounds of their tendency to spread out. He who was now contained in himself carried out a methodical investigation into things. Desiring to examine its total material and immaterial substance, he investigated the body, and he perceived the body to be impure, full of suffering, impermanent, without an owner, and again devoid of self. For on those grounds, on the grounds of impermanence and emptiness, on the grounds of absence of self and of suffering, he, by the most excellent among mundane paths, caused the tree of afflictions to shake. Since everything, after not existing, now exists, and after existing it never exists again, and since the world is causal and has disappearance as a cause, therefore he understood that the world is impermanent. In so far as a creature's industry, motivated by bond-making or bond-breaking impulse, is dependent on a prescription named pleasure for counteracting pain, he saw on that account that existence is suffering. And in so far as separateness is a construct, there being no one who creates or who is made known, but doing arises out of a totality, he realised on that account that this world is empty. Since the throng of humanity is passive, not autonomous, and no one exercises direct control over the workings of the body, but states of being arise dependent on this and that, he found in that sense that the world is devoid of self. Then, like air in the hot season, got from fanning. Like fire, latent in wood, got from rubbing. And like water under the ground, got from digging. That supramundane path, which is hard to reach, he reached. As a bow of true knowledge, clad in the armour of awareness, standing up in a chariot, pure practice of integrity. He took his stance for victory, ready to engage in battle his enemies, the afflictions, who were ranged on the battlefield of his mind. Then, unsheathing a sword that the limbs of awakening had honed, standing in the supreme chariot of true motivation, with an army containing the elephants of the branches of the path, he gradually penetrated the ranks of the afflictions. With arrows made from the presence of mindfulness, instantly he shot those enemies whose substance is upside downness. He split apart four enemies, four causes of suffering, with four arrows, each having its own range. With the five incomparable noble powers, he broke five uncultivated areas of mental ground. And with the eight true elephants, which are the branches of the path, he drove away eight elephants of fakery. And so, having shaken off every vestige of the personality view, 
being free of doubt in regard to the four truths, and knowing the score in regard to pure practice of integrity, he attained the first fruit of Dharma. By glimpsing the noble foursome, and by being released from one portion of the afflictions, by realizing for himself what was specific to him, as well as by witnessing the ease of the sages. Through the stability of his stillness and the constancy of his steadiness, through not being altogether bewildered about the four truths, and through not being full of holes in the supreme practice of integrity, he became free of doubt in the truth of Dharma. Released from the net of shabby views, seeing the world as it really is, he attained a joy pregnant with knowing, and his quiet certainty in the Guru deepened all the more. For he who understands that the doing in this world is determined neither by any outside cause nor by no cause, and who appreciates everything depending on everything, he sees the ultimate noble Dharma. And he who sees as the greatest good the Dharma that is peaceful, salutary, ageless, and free of the red taint of passion, and who sees its teacher as the noblest of the noble, he, as one who has got the eye, is meeting Buddha. When a healthy man has been freed from illness by salutary instruction, and he is aware of his debt of gratitude, just as he sees his healer in his mind's eye, gratefully acknowledging his benevolence and knowledge of his subject. Exactly so is a finder of reality, who, set free by the noble path, is the reality of being noble. His body being a seeing eye, he sees the realized one gratefully acknowledging his benevolence and all-knowingness. Sprung free from pernicious theories, seeing an end to becoming, and feeling horror for the consequences of affliction, Nanda trembled not at death or hellish realms, as full of skin, sinew, fat, blood, bone and flesh, as full of hair and a mass of other such unholy stuff, Nanda then observed the body to be. He looked into its essential reality and found not even an atom. By the yoke of that very practice, he, firm in himself, minimized the duality of love and hate. Being himself big across the chest, he made those two small, and so obtained the second fruit in the noble Dharma. A small vestige of the great enemy, red passion, whose straining bow is impatient desire, and whose arrow is a fixed conception. He destroyed using weapons procured from the body as it naturally is, using the darts of unpleasantness, weapons from the armory of practice. That gestating love rival, malice, whose weapon is hatred and whose errant arrow is anger, he slayed 
with the arrows of kindness, which are contained in a quiver of constancy and released from the bowstring of patience. And so the hero cut the three roots of shameful conduct using three seats of release as if three rival princes bearing bows in the van of their armies had been cut down by one prince using three iron points. In order to go entirely beyond the sphere of desire, he overpowered those enemies that grab the heel, so that he attained, because of practice, the fruit of not returning, and stood as if at the gateway to the citadel of Nirvana. Distanced from desires and tainty things, containing ideas and containing thoughts, born of solitude and possessed of joy and ease, is the first stage of meditation which he then entered. Released from the burning of the bonfire of desires, he derived great gladness from ease in the act of meditating. Ease like a heat-exhausted man diving into water, or like a pauper coming into great wealth. Even in that he realised Ideas about aforesaid things, and thoughts about what is or is not good, are something not quieted, causing disturbance in the mind, and so he decided to cut them out. For, just as waves produce disturbance in a river bearing a steady flow of tranquil water, so ideas like waves of thought, disturb the water of the one-pointed mind. And just as noises are a source of bother to one who is weary and fallen fast asleep, so do ideas become bothersome to one who is indulging in his original state of unitary awareness. And so, Gradually bereft of idea and thought, his mind tranquil from one-pointedness, he realised the joy and ease born of balanced stillness, that inner well-being which is the second stage of meditation. And on reaching that stage, in which the mind is silent, he experienced an intense joy that he had never experienced before. But here too he found a fault in joy, just as he had in ideas. For when a man finds intense joy in anything, paradoxically, suffering for him is right there. Hence, seeing the faults there in joy, he kept going up, into practice that goes beyond joy. And so, experiencing the ease enjoyed by the noble ones from non-attachment to joy, knowing it totally with his body, he remained indifferent, fully aware, and, having realised the third stage of meditation, steady. Since the ease here is beyond any ease, and there is no progression of ease beyond it, therefore, as a knower of higher and lower, he realised it as a condition of resplendent wholeness, which he deemed, in a friendly way, to be superlative. Then, even in that stage of meditation, he found a fault, he saw it as better to be quiet, not excited. Whereas his mind was fluctuating tirelessly because of ease circulating. 
In excitement there is interference, and where there is interference there is suffering. Which is why, in so far as ease is excitatory, devotees who are desirous of quiet give up that ease. Then, having already transcended ease and suffering and emotional reactivity, he realized the lucidity in which there is indifference and full awareness. Thus, beyond suffering and ease is the fourth stage of meditation. Since in this there is neither ease nor suffering, and the act of knowing abides here, being its own object, Therefore utter lucidity through indifference and awareness is specified in the protocol for the fourth stage of meditation. Consequently, relying on the fourth stage of meditation, he made up his mind to win the worthy state. Like a king joining forces with a strong and noble ally, and then aspiring to conquer unconquered lands. Then he cut the five upper fetters with the sword of intuitive wisdom which is raised aloft by cultivation of the mind. He completely severed the five aspirational fetters which are bound up with superiority and tied to the first person. Again with the seven elephants of the limbs of awakening, he crushed the seven dormant tendencies of the mind. Like time, when their destruction is due, crushing the seven continents by means of the seven planets. The action which on fire, trees, ghee and water is exerted by rain clouds, wind, a flame and the sun. Nanda exerted that action on the faults, quenching, uprooting, burning and drying them up. Thus he overcame three surges, three sharks, three swells, the unity of water, five currents, two shores and two crocodiles. In his eight-piece raft, he crossed the flood of suffering, which is so hard to cross. Having attained to the seat of Arhathud, he was worthy of being served. Without ambition, without partiality, without expectation. Without fear, sorrow, pride or passion. While being nothing but himself, he seemed in his constancy to be different. And so Nanda, who, through the instruction of his brother and teacher, and through his own valiant effort, had quieted his mind and fulfilled his task, spoke to himself these words. Praise be to him, the Sugata the one gone well, through whose compassionate pursuit of my welfare, great agonies were turned away and greater comforts conferred. For while being dragged by ignoble physicality down a path pregnant with suffering, I was turned back by the hook of his words, like an elephant in musk by a driver's hook. For through the liberating knowledge of the compassionate teacher who extracted a dart of passion that was lodged in my heart, now such abundant ease is mine. Oh, how happy I am in the loss of everything. For by putting out the burning fire of desires, using the water of constancy as if using water to put out a blaze. I have now come to a state of supreme refreshment, 
like a hot person descending into a cool pool. Nothing is dear to me, nor offensive to me. There is no liking in me, much less disliking. In the absence of those two, I am enjoying the moment, like one immune to cold and heat. Like gaining safety after great danger. Like gaining release after long imprisonment. Like having no boat and yet gaining the far shore after a mighty deluge. And like gaining clarity after fearful darkness. Like gaining health out of incurable illness. Relief from immeasurable debt. Or escape from an enemy presence. Or like gaining after a famine plentiful food. Thus have I come to utmost quiet through the quieting influence of the teacher. Again and repeatedly I do homage to him. Homage, homage to the worthy one, the realized one. By him I was taken to the golden peaked mountain and to heaven, where with the example of the she-monkey, and by means of the women who wander the triple heaven, I who was a slave to love, sunk in girl-filled strife, was lifted up and out. From that extreme predicament, from that worthless mire, up he dragged me like a feeble-footed elephant from the mud, to be released into this quieted, dustless, feverless, sorrowless, ultimate, true reality, which is free from darkness. I salute the great, supremely compassionate seer, bowing my head to him, the knower of types, the knower of hearts the fully awakened one, the holder of the ten powers, the best of healers, the deliverer. Again I bow to him. The seventeenth canto in the epic poem Handsome Nanda, titled Obtaining the Deathless Nectar. And so, like a young initiate who mastered the Vedas, like a trader who turned a quick profit, or like a royal warrior who conquered a hostile army, a success, Nanda approached the Guru. For it is pleasant at a time when wisdom has been fully realised, for teacher to see student, and for student to see teacher each thinking, your toil has rewarded me, for which same reason the wish to see Nanda arose in the sage. Thus is a noble person obliged to pay respect to his face, to the one through whom he has acquired distinction. Even a noble person who retains the taint of redness is so obliged, out of gratitude. How much more is one with no red taint, all pride having perished? For when devotion springs from an agenda or desire, there it remains rooted. But when a person has love and devotion for Dharma, that person is steeped to the core in tranquility. And so, a glowing gold in his yellow-red robe, he bowed his head to the Guru, like a Karnikara tree, with an outburst of ruddy shoots, and a glorious blaze of flowers, nodding in the wind. Then, 
as a manifestation of his individual merit as a student, and indeed of the great sage's merit as a teacher, and not out of pride. He described his own accomplishment of the work that has to be done. The splinter of a view that had penetrated to my core, O mighty one, was paining me intensely, being very sharp. Via the jaws of the pincers of your words, by means of a means and by way of a mouth, it was pulled out of me as a splinter is removed by a surgeon. A doubt by which I fell into a state of hesitant questioning, O one beyond doubt, has been eradicated in me. Through your teaching I have arrived at a true path, like a straggler under a good guide, getting on the road. With senses ruled by relishing, I madly drank the drug of love. Its action was blocked in me by the antidote of your words, as a deadly poison is by a great remedy. Rebirth is over, O refuter of rebirth. I am dwelling as one with observance of true dharma. What was for me to do, O doer of the necessary, is totally done. I am present in the world without being of the world. Having drunk from the milk cow of your voice, whose udder is loving kindness, whose lovely dewlap is figures of speech, who is milked for true dharma, and whose horns are boldness of expression, I am properly satisfied, O most excellent one. Like a little calf, that because of thirst has drunk milk. And so, O sage, hear from me in brief what, through seeing, I have made my own. Though you know it anyway, O all-knowing one, still I wish to mention how I have worked on myself. For true freedom-loving people, however individual they are, when they hear of another person's plan that led to freedom, will happily work at freedom via that same path, like sick men hearing the plan of one who became free from a disease. In a birth, I perceive earth and the other elements, but in earth and those other elements, I perceive no self at all. On that basis, there is no attachment in me to those elements. My orientation is equal with regard to my body and outside. Again, the five skandhas, beginning with the organised body, I see to be inconstant and without substance, as well as unreal and life-negating. Therefore I am free from those pernicious constructs. Since I see for myself an arising and a vanishing in all situations in the realms of the senses, therefore again there is in me no clinging to those aforementioned elements which are impermanent, impersonal and unsatisfactory. Again, on the grounds that I see the whole world as emerging and in the same moment passing away, as having no essential meaning and not being as it ought to be. On these grounds, because of meditation, the world is bound fast by my mind, in such a way that there is no flicker in me of I am. 
there is all manner of indulging in the four sorts of food. But since I am not attached to how I take food, since when it comes to food I am not congealed or trussed up, I am free on that score from three kinds of becoming. In the daily round of Dharma practice, since I am neither certain about nor bound in mind to visual, auditory and other kinds of perception, and since through that Dharma round I am graced by trailing equanimity, on that account I am detached and am free. After speaking thus, he prostrated himself on the ground with his whole body, out of deep appreciation for the Guru. He looked like a great fallen column of gold tinged with red sandalwood. Then, after listening to him who had emerged already out of heedlessness, after hearing his firmness and his testimony, and a clarity consistent with the gist of Dharma, the sage boomed at him like a thundercloud. You who stands firm in the Dharma which is loved by those who study it, stand up. Why are you fallen with your head at my feet? The prostration does not honour me so much as this sure-footedness in the Dharma. Today, conqueror of yourself, you have truly gone forth, since you have thereby gained sovereignty over yourself. For in a person who has conquered himself, going forth has worked. Whereas, in an impulsive person, whose senses remain unconquered, it has not. Today you are possessed of purity of the highest order, in that your voice, body and mind are untainted, and in that, henceforward, my gentle friend, you will not again be confined in the ungentle womb of unready slumber. Listening ears open to the truth which is replete with listening and with purpose. Today you stand sure-footed in the Dharma in a manner that befits the listening tradition. For a man equipped with listening ears who is wavering is like a swordsman lacking valour. He is worthy of blame. Ah, what firmness in you, who is a slave to objects no more, in that you have willed the means of liberation. For, facing the end of existence in this world, and thinking, I will be finished, it is a fool who gives in to a state of quivering anxiety. Happily, this meeting with the present moment, which is so hard to come by, is not being wasted under the sway of ignorance. For a man who has been down goes up with difficulty, like a turtle to a hole in a yoke in the foaming sea. Having conquered Mara, who is so hard to stop in battle. Today, at the forefront of the fight, you are a hero among men. For even a hero is not recognised as a hero, who is beaten by the foe-like faults. Today, having extinguished the flaming fire of redness, happily you will sleep well, free of fever. For even on a fabulous bed, he sleeps badly who is being burned in his mind 
by the fires of affliction. You used markedly to be mad about possessions. Today, because you have stopped thirsting, you are rich. For as long as a man in the world thirsts, however rich he may be, he is always deprived. Today you may fittingly proclaim that King Shuddodana is your father. For it is not commendable for a backslider, after falling from the Dharma alighted on by ancestors, to proclaim his lineage. How great it is that you have reached the deepest tranquillity, like a man making it through a wasteland and gaining possession of treasure. For everybody in the flux of samsara is afflicted by fear, just like a man in a wasteland. When shall I see Nanda settled, given over to the living of a forest beggar's life? So thinking, I had harboured from the start the desire to see you thus. What a wonderful sight you are for me to behold. For even an unlovely sort is a sight to behold, when he is well adorned with his own best features. But a man who is full of the befouling faults, strikingly beautiful man though he may be, is truly ugly. Developed in you today is the real wisdom by which you have done totally the work you had to do on yourself. For even a highly educated man lacks wisdom if wisdom fails to show in his practice of a better way. So it is with seeing among people with eyes open and with eyes closed. For when a man lacks sight that is packed with intuition, though he has eyes, the eye is not present in him. Struck by calamity, stung to do something to combat suffering, the world exhausts itself with work like ploughing. And yet it is ceaselessly revisited by that suffering to which, using what you know, you today have put an end. People in the world are impelled ever forward by thinking, there might be for me no hardship, just happiness. And yet the world does not know a means whereby that happiness might come to be, that rarely attained happiness which you today have properly realised. While the Tathagata told him this and more for his benefit, Nanda remained firm in his judgement and thinking, and was indifferent to plaudits or criticisms. With hands joined he spoke these words. O oh, how particular, O oh, seer of particularities, is this compassion that you have shown to me. Since I who was sunk, glorious one, in the mire of love, have been a reluctant refugee from the terror of samsara. If not set free by you, a brother a guide along a better way, a fruitful father, and equally a mother. I would be done for. Like a straggler dropped from a caravan, I would not have made it. Solitude is sweet for one who is calm and contented, who looks into and has learned what is. 
Again, for one who is sober and shorn of conceits. For one who is detached in his decision-making. Dispassion is a pleasure. And so, through squarely realising what is, through shaking off faults and coming to quiet, I worry now neither about my own place nor about the person there nor about apsarases, nor about gods. For now that I have tasted this pure, peaceful happiness, my mind no longer hankers after happiness born of desires. Just as the costliest earthly fare cannot entice a god who has supped the heavenly nectar. Alas, the world has its eyes closed by blind unconsciousness. It does not see utmost happiness in a different robe. Flinging away lasting inner happiness, it exhausts itself so in pursuit of sensual happiness. For just as a fool, having made it to a jewel mine, might leave the jewels and carry off inferior crystals. So would one reject the highest happiness of full awakening and struggle to gain sensual gratification. O oh, high indeed, then, is the order of that desire to favour living beings, which the Tathagata has, overflowing with benevolence. Since, O oh sage, you throw away the highest order happiness of meditation and are consumed by your effort to stop others' suffering. How today could I possibly repay you, my compassionate guru, whose desire is others' welfare, by whom I was taken totally up and out of the foaming sea of becoming, like a man out of a great ocean when his boat is being battered by waves. Then the sage, hearing his well-founded words, which signified the removal of all pollutants, voiced as the very best of speakers these lines that none but a Buddha, being sheer radiance, should voice. As a man of action who got the job done and who knows the primary task, none but you, O oh crafty man, should express this affirmation. Like a great trader, having crossed a wasteland and got the goods, who affirms the work of a good guide. An Arhat, a man of action whose mind has come to quiet, knows the Buddha as a charioteer of human steeds who needed taming. Not even a truth seer appreciates the Buddha in this manner. How much less does an ordinary person, however intelligent he may be? This gratitude is fitting again, in none but you, whose mind has been liberated from the dust of the passions and from darkness. For while dust prevails in the world, O man of gratitude, real gratitude is a rare state of being. O possessor of Dharma, since because of abiding by Dharma, you have skill in making it your own and quiet confidence in me. I have something else to say to you, for you are surrendered and devoted and up to the task. Walking the transcendent walk, you have done the work that needed to be done. In you, there is not the slightest thing left to work on. From now on, my friend, 
go with compassion, freeing up others who are pulled down into their troubles. The lowest sort of man only ever sets to work for an object in this world. But a man in the middle does work both for this world and for the world to come. A man in the middle, I repeat, works for a result in the future. The superior type, however, tends towards abstention from positive action. But deemed to be higher than the highest in this world, is he who, having realised the supreme ultimate Dharma, desires without worrying about the trouble to himself to teach tranquillity to others. Therefore, forgetting the work that needs to be done in this world on the self, do now, stout soul, what can be done for others. Among beings who are wandering in the night, their minds shrouded in darkness, let the lamp of this transmission be carried. Just let the astonished people in the city say, while you are standing firm, voicing Dharma directions, Well, what a wonder this is, that he who was a man of passion is preaching liberation. Then, surely, when she hears of your steadfast mind, with its chariots turned back from sundry objects, your wife, following your example, will also talk to women at home, the talk of dispassion. For, with you showing constancy of the highest order, as you get to the bottom of what is, she surely will not enjoy life in the palace. Just as the mind of an enlightened man does not enjoy sensual pleasures, when his mental state is tranquil and controlled, and his thinking is detached and distinct. Thus spoke the worthy one, the instructor whose compassion was of the highest order, whose words, and equally whose feet, Nanda had accepted, using his head. Then, at ease in himself, his heart at peace, his task ended. He left the sage's side like an elephant free of rut. When the occasion arose, he entered the town for begging and attracted the citizen's gaze. Being impartial towards gain, loss, comfort, discomfort, and the like, and with his senses composed, he was free of longing. And being there, in the moment, he talked of liberation to people so inclined, never putting down others on a wrong path, or raising himself up. This work is pregnant with the purpose of release. It is for cessation, not for titillation. It is wrought out of the figurative expression of kavya poetry in order to capture an audience whose minds are on other things. For what I have written here, not pertaining to liberation, I have written in accordance with the conventions of Kavya poetry. This is through asking myself how the bitter pill might be made pleasant to swallow, like bitter medicine mixed with something sweet. 
seeing in general that the world is moved primarily by fondness for objects and is repelled by liberation. I, for whom liberation is paramount, have told it here like it is, using a caviar poem as a pretext. Being aware of the deceit, take from this verb-rooted dust what pertains to peace and not to idle pleasure. Then, elemental dust, assuredly, shall yield up serviceable gold. The eighteenth canto in the epic poem Handsome Nanda, titled Knowing Affirmation. This is the work of a beggar, the respected teacher Ashvagosha of Saketa, son of the noble Suvarnakshi, crafter of epic poetry and talker of the great 